Hello and welcome to Africa, this enormous and astonishing continent. South Africa, to be more precise, just a short drive outside Johannesburg. And I'm here to talk to a remarkable man, Credo Mutwa. When I first came to South Africa about 18 months ago, within two or three days, I was introduced to Credo Mutwa. I'd never heard of him at the time, but from the moment I met him, I didn't stop listening and he didn't stop talking for at least five hours. And within the first few minutes, I realized I wasn't just in the presence here of a man of great knowledge, and he's certainly that. I was in the presence of a genius, a unique human being. And Crater Mutwa is without doubt the most incredible man it has been my honor to meet. Credo is what some people around the world call a shaman, and some deeply, deeply ignorant people call a witch doctor. And to give him his official title, he's a Sanusi in the Zulu nation. Uh, Sanusi is the carrier, the keeper of the ancient knowledge, the ancient knowledge of so much, including the ancient knowledge of history of Africa, where all this came from, where the people came from, what the truth of history is, instead of the uh, largely nonsensical version of history that we get through the universities and the schools from very, very well educated professors who know. There are only two Sanusis left in South Africa. Credo is one. And that's terrifying because it means the true version of the history of this continent is dying being lost to this official nonsense that we're told is history, but it's absolute garbage. History has been rewritten, and the people who can put that history together again are going out of this world as they age and are not replaced. So you're about to have, as I have, the enormous privilege of hearing this man talk and seeing his knowledge preserved for as long as the electronic medium exists. He is the official story teller and keeper of the history, the knowledge of the Zulu people. But you know, knowledge is a very dangerous thing when you're trying to hold people down into a mind prison, you're trying to manipulate them, you're trying to control them. And so people like Credo Mutwa who have the knowledge to rewrite history and therefore rewrite the present, they are very dangerous people to those that wish to control and suppress. This man has had endless threats to his life, endless attempts on his life, right up to the last few days. And he has upset the uh, hierarchy of his own people as much as he's upset those others in other cultures and other races that wish also to suppress the truth for reasons of preserving their own religious domination or keeping people in ignorance. And so I've come here to talk to Credo at length about many things. And this is a series of unique videos with a unique man. And what we're going to start out with is to concentrate on a bizarre story, <laughs> an off-the-wall story, you would think, but one which he is confirming at every turn from his own background, his own unique knowledge of this continent. Over the last few years, as I've been trying to uncover how the world's controlled by a few people, which it is, and who those people are, it has emerged from my research that Bizarre as it may seem, uh, a reptilian race from another world, interbred with humanity in the far ancient world, creating hybrid crossbreed bloodlines. You see references to these in the Old Testament and into endless of the ancient texts in the Old Testament. It talks about the sons of God, which in the original is sons of the gods, plural, interbreeding with the daughters of men to create the hybrid uh, race, the Nephilim. These gods were the literal gods of the ancient people. And they used to sacrifice people literally to the gods. 
And these crossbreed bloodlines, as ancient accounts tell around the world, were put into the positions of ruling royal power in the ancient world. And then, as is happening today, when you do the genealogy of the ruling families and the ruling uh, positions of power in the world, be they the 42 presidents of the United States up to Bill Clinton, be they the British royal family, be the uh, aristocracy of Europe, any of these key ruling elites, the top of the banking system, the top of the global business system, you hit the family lines which go back to these same ruling lines of the ancient world, royal lines, that the ancient accounts say were the crossbreeds between humanity and these reptilian gods. In other words, a reptilian extraterrestrial race has been controlling planet Earth for thousands of years to this day and putting its genetic compatible bloodlines into the positions of power as presidents, prime ministers, banking leaders, business leaders, etc. And this explains so many things where we get the divine right of kings from, the divine right to rule because of the bloodline, the genetics. Why these ruling families of the aristocracy and the royal families have always incessantly interbred with each other, just as the Eastern establishment families of the United States do that produce so many presidents and banking leaders and administrators of government in the United States. And astonishingly, as bizarre as I keep saying and seemingly ridiculous as this story may be from our conditioned perspective of life and reality. When I started talking to Credo Mutwa from his African experience and knowledge of the most staggering depths and variety, he tells exactly the same story that I have uncovered around the world exactly in great detail. And if Africa and the world is ever going to be free, and we are, then they have to listen to this man. And they have to listen now. I started out by talking to Credo about the origin of the knowledge that he is about to share with us for the first time in so many cases. Because this is the knowledge that only initiates normally get. But as Credo says, the world needs to know this. And so, this is a unique video. And this is a unique man. And like I say, I asked him first about the origin of the knowledge that he's about to pass on. When the white man started destroying our religion, when he started demonizing our gods, when he started ridiculing what we believed in and actually using educated Africans to destroy that ancient African religion. In many parts of Africa, say, our ancient religion went underground. And there were, call them secret societies, all over South Africa and Central Africa and East Africa and West Africa where this knowledge was, was stored and kept by aging guardians, many, many of whom did not know that in other parts of the land there were other guardians who were doing exactly as they were doing. Now, when I first became a Sangom, I was already, say, a person of education. I had entered school as a child of 14 years. And when I became a Sangoma, I was a youth of 16 years. And what, what my aunt and my, grandma, my grandfather, as well as my maternal grandmother, taught me, 
shook me to the core of my soul. I found that the mission schools had been teaching me lies about my people all along. Missionaries had told us as children that the only light came to Africa with white people, that before the white men came, we black people had no idea about God. We had no belief in a life after death. And that our people were just a race of savages who used to lie around in the sun, womanize, fight, and drink beer every day. I was suddenly awakened to the fact that Africa, Africans had in fact been far greater intellectually than the missionaries were, were willing to give them credit for. That like the white men, we had astrology, astronomy, we had surgery. In fact, I found that Zulu surgeons in the early years of the 19th century and the 18th century and even beyond could perform operations which white surgeons were not capable of operating. And the more I learned about my peoples, the more I wanted to learn. And when my, my initiation under my aunt Mina and my grandfather Zigo had ended, I wanted to know more and more and more. And sometimes I had to pay a ghastly price in order to, to, to gain this knowledge. In one place, here in the, in the north western Transvaal, my, my teachers found that I was really uncircumcised. And they told me bluntly that if I wanted to be a member of this secret society, I had to undergo circumcision. And I did, and it was screamingly painful, I assure you, because it was done with a clasp knife which somebody must have blunted a little bit just to make sure that I got the message. Well, I, I had the same done, but I was, I was asleep at the time, so <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have that in common. And say, in some places in Southern Africa, if you wanted to learn the secrets of a certain secret society, you had to do dreadful things which I cannot repeat here. And at one time in Barotsiland, in the west of, of uh, 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 what is today Zambia, the, the, my, my teacher said, look, how far are you willing to go in order to become one of us? I said, I am willing to go anywhere. He looked at me and he said, listen, educated man, we are tired of people like you. White men come amongst us to milk our minds and then to kill us. We want to be sure that we can trust you. And wait, sir. I said, great one, I am willing to do anything. He said, are you? I said, yes. And then, and then, they went into a graveyard. And from there, they removed the hand of a corpse dead two days, and they brought it, and they challenged me to cook it 
and eat it. I did so. And these were the peoples who first told me about a race of highly intelligent beings which they called the Chitauri, the Tokas, a race of creatures which look like reptiles who have ruled the world for hundreds if not thousands of, of years. Through this dreadful act I was able to gain knowledge which was denied to even the highest Sangomas because they could not they would not go through the ritual I went to. This oh. is how secret knowledge is protected in, in Africa. So, and at one time, let me tell you another thing. Again in Barozi land, on the border between Angola and, and, and North Rhodesia as it was called, I was brought into a hut and in the hut was a young woman. She was as black as ebony and her hair was like a huge black cloud on her head. Her teeth had been sharpened in the Barozi fashion until they looked like those of a reptile. And Mutwa was very puzzled. What's this lady doing here? This I'm supposed to spend several nights in this hut. So what is she? What is she doing here? Now, Credo Mutwa being a frightened Zulu, afraid of women but not afraid of wild animals, decided to sleep with his back to the wall, giving the lady a nice clean bed. And on the following day, Credo Mutwa was fined 15 pounds by the local chief because I had refused a sacred gift. <laughs> I had been supposed to do something very amazing to this lady to show that I was one of the people. Bad luck. <laughs> Bad luck. But <laughs> <laughs> why, Credo, have you chosen to reveal this knowledge now um, to a much, much wider audience? Mr. David, please, Africa is dying. Africa say, is being murdered. And we are sitting here like bloody fools and we don't realize what's being done to our people. Say, I have proof that can stand in any true court of law that the disease called AIDS is a man-made disease and this disease is going to kill three quarters of South Africa's black people within the next 10 years say there are wars in Africa which make no sense to me as a black man. Please, when people fight a war, Mr. David, why do they fight? People fight in order to get rid of something that is giving them pain. Whether that something is a tribal chief or a corrupt modern government. They want to fight to remove this burden or to be destroyed by it. That is the idea behind a rebellion. But in Africa we find wars where a group of rebels challenges a government and tries to fight against it. And then these wars and in the total destruction of that particular country, 
where neither the rebels nor the government wins anymore. And why? Because you, you find this force of rebels facing the government and all of a sudden the rebel army splits into little factions which start fighting each other and not the real enemy. Where, and soon it becomes a situation where everybody is fighting everybody else and the whole thing is getting nowhere. Say, I say that these wars which are destroying Africa this way are orchestrated by forces from outside Africa. Our people say, need development. Our people need peace in Africa. We are basically a peaceful people. We are not warlike. Don't let historians tell you a lot of rubbish. Africa is not perceived by the people outside her as she really is. One, my people are Zulus, of a tribe famous for warrior exploits for many, many years now. But wait, do you know, sir, that Zulu people actually hated war and didn't love it, as historians would have you believe? We Zulu people call war Impi, I-M-P-I, and we call evil Impi or Ububi. Now, the word Imbi and the word Imbi come from exactly the same root, which means that which is evil. We, we call copper Itusi, which means the helper, the frightener away of evil spirits. But we call iron Insimbi which means the evil metal, the metal of war. Now, when a Zulu went to battle, he spiritually prepared himself for fighting. But when he came back from battle, a Zulu would undergo a ceremony of purification, a very, very painful ritual which lasted for some seven days before he was even allowed to touch his wife. But wait for this. In England, we have got the lady, Sarah Churchill, Duchess of Marlborough, writing in her diary that her husband, Sir John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough, after the terrible battle of Blenheim, had made love to her three times while still wearing his top boots. Wait, sir. Listen to that. Here is a man coming into his tent or whatever it was, with his boots still stinking with the blood of horses and the blood of men, and probably with human flesh still attached to the, to, the, to the soles of those boots, here is this man making love to his wife. What kind of attitude is that? That a man would come smelling of death and destruction to desecrate his wife in three Torrid sessions, we never did that in Africa. We hated war. And furthermore, our people, the black people of Southern Africa, are accused of having been a male-dominated society. Absolute bloody poppycocks. Zulus were a, a female-dominated society. And if you want proof of that, ask yourself, who killed King Shaga? 
who planned Shaka's murder, two women, twins, Mama and Mkabai, Shaka's aunt, who was the greatest advisor of King Shaka. His mother, Nandi, she used to plan every one of Shaka's military campaigns right down to the last detail. So, everywhere in South Africa, our word for great also means female, but that is something we shall discuss at another time. So, we are, Africa is being murdered, say, in a race of people which once founded some of the world's greatest civilizations is being cruelly exterminated and our politicians appear to be hypnotized as like a little antelope hypnotized by a python. Don't our leaders know what is going on in Africa? I'm going to talk, sir. I'm going to talk and I'm going to reveal and damn the consequences. I am not a brave man, but it's high, it's high time somebody stood up and exposed the conspiracy around Africa and their people. So let's start looking then at the force that is the common theme through all this history to the present day that's been manipulating these highly malevolent, highly destructive situations. Um, my own research uh, around the world has certainly focused in on the fact that there is a force not of this world, shall we say, that is the common theme. What is your experience and your knowledge of an extraterrestrial involvement in the history of Africa? One of the most secret stories that was revealed to me, sir, is about these beings. This story was revealed to me first in Barotsident, then in the country today called Rwanda, once known as Rwanda Urundi. Then I learned about this story at that time on the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro. This is the story a story you find throughout Africa. There was once a time when the blue sky was invisible, when the whole world was covered with mist, when you could not see the sun as it is now, you only saw it as a, a, a splash of white light moving slowly across the sky. At that time, there was an eternal drizzle every day of the year. At that time, people could not see the stars. People only saw the trees growing trees which were very, very big. There was no desert at that time, only jungle everywhere where you went. At that time, say, people were what we call in Zulu, Ngubili. A human being was both male and female in one body. And out of the sky, one day came terrible objects. They were like gigantic bowls made of huge gleaming gold. They were shaped like bowls without strings and they were bigger than the biggest mountains. They came out of the sky bringing great noise black smoke and fire with them. And out of those huge objects came 
them. At that time, sir, human beings could not speak. We had no gift of language at that time. And people had, however, great mental power. A man would go into the bush and using the power of his mind, actually call out an animal which he wanted to hunt and kill for his children. And the animal would appear and kneel down before the man, and the man would kill the animal and take it home. But when the Chitawuli arrived in Africa, they told our people that they were gods and that they were going to give us human beings great gifts on one condition. We had to worship them and accept them as our creators. Some told our people that they were our elder brothers and that this earth had produced them generations ago and they said they had come back to the green womb of their mother and that they were going to make us into gods what they did they created a very strange pair of caves in the land they dug two caves in one cave was a green light in another cave was a red light. And they drove human beings into these caves. And each human being had to choose which cave the human being wanted to go into. And those who went into the green cave came out as women. And those who went into the red cave came out as men. And then the talkers, the Chitauri, told our people that now they were perfect. But the moment the first men saw the first women, a terrible row erupted. The women hated the men because they looked between their legs and they saw what they thought were snakes dangling between the legs of the men. And the men hated the women because they looked on their chests and they saw these big things. What they were, they did not know. And then the Chitauri laughed. It was to them a very, very big joke. And then the Chitauri said, If you serve us, you wretched little human beings, we are going to make you into gods. And the human beings agreed to serve the Chitauri. And the Chitauri gave human beings a second gift, the gift of language. People started talking with their tongues where they had talked with their minds before. And there was a big rubbish starting again because this man did not know the language of that man. And when this man greeted that man, this man thought that he was being insulted and saw a lot of murder and culpable homicide starting taking place all over the world. When our people were given language, they found to their horror that they had lost much of their mental powers. They had paid a terrible price. But the Chitauri were now the masters of human beings. They made them the, the human beings to go into holes in the ground and to mine metal, gold, copper, tin, all kinds of metal the Chitauri forced our people to mine. And the people were very unhappy because they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, 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 they couldn't cope 
with the new sexual differences which were there now between men and women. And then, from amongst the, 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 the Chitauri came a very good female Chitauri. Her name was Mai Nzarantwari Samahongo. Mai Nzarantwari Samahongo was the senior wife of the terrible chief of the Chitauri, Umbaba Gorontwari Samahongo. She was sorry for human beings, this great reptile lady. She said to the poor people, Ow, you are unhappy. And the people said, Yes, great one. We go into the holes every day, we dig the stones and we bring it to the gods. But we are not happy. And my Zarantwari scratched her scaly chin and began to think and to think. She was terribly ugly. Her eyes were awful, like lights in the darkness. But she had mess in her heart. And she taught the men and the women how to make love. And she said, look, we, we divided you into males and females. Now this action is going to bring you together. Ah, but it did not. Because anyone who receives a gift from the Ntwari, the children of the python, is always in trouble. What happened was that when one guy slept with his wife, he didn't find her much, so he went to steal another guy's wife, and there was a brick, a big remorse, as we say in Africa, starting. So men started stealing each other's wives and each other's girlfriends, and women started stealing each other's husbands, and there was a big nonsense in the land. And King Umbaba, the terrible uh, lord of the Ntwari, the, the reptile people, said, look what you've done, you stupid old woman. Now these people, they are, they are making such a noise. Listen to all that screaming in the bush. They are busy making love there and our gold is not being dug and you are responsible for this. And Zarantwari thought and thought and thought and thought and then she got a plan. And she said, I will make them stop. When they make love to each other, the female is going to get pregnant. And when she is pregnant, the male is going to leave her alone. And that noise in the bush will not be so disturbing to you, my lord. And Umbaba said, you had better. There is no production here. And so all the women in the world was pregnant and Umbaba was furious with his wife. And so it went on and on until one day Nzarantwari activated a black hero called Mweru. And Mweru challenged the great chief of the serpent people to a fight. And he cut off the royal pennies of the king of the snake people. And that caused a big war. Mweru ran away, but Umbaba, the terrible chief of the people, caught him and arrested him and brought him to his village. And there, the great chief Korontwari Umbaba said, look, you cut off my thing and I have replaced it with one made of gold and I can't make love to my wife anymore. You think too much, you wretched little human being. Now, Umbaba had a terrible nail in one of his hands, a claw. And with this claw, he drove the claw into poor Mweru's nostril, making a terrible hole into his brain. And he started drinking Mweru's brain, and then he threw away the corpse. To this day, sir, we believe that the people, the Chitauri people, 
they eat human brains. And strangely enough, scientists have found skulls where the human brain has been removed and eaten by someone or something. Well, the, um, the hearing you speak here, um, so many things uh, come to mind. First of all, you're saying that telepathy was the key form of communication yeah. before the Chilihuli, the reptilians came. Yes, sir. And um, it, I guess it's like a muscle. When you use it, it gets more sensitive and more powerful. So the more you use your telepathy, the more powerful your mind got. And then when language came, it almost brought us into this three-dimensional world and disconnected us from that mind power that we had yeah. before. Yes, sir. And yes. it's also interesting that the, the, the story that you talk about the language being given, and then the different languages being given. And of course, that turns up in the uh, uh, Old Testament, in the Bible. It turns up in stories all over the world about the fact that we were divided by language so we couldn't communicate. And as someone who publishes books, I know today how difficult it is to communicate through books when you've got endless different languages. So yes. it's been a brilliant form of control for a long time. Yes, sir. Even, even now here in South Africa, today, sir, black people prefer to speak to each other in English if they belong to different tribes. And they have even, over the many decades, black youths have even created a lingua franca of their own, which we call Tsotsi, Tsotsi language, which is a mixture of African words and, and Afrikaans words. They do this in order to bridge the incredible language gap which exists between black people in South Africa. Let me show you say, an amusing thing, how different languages are. The, the language of the Khoza people of the Eastern Cape is very similar to Zulu, but certain important words in the Zulu language good words are viewed as obscenities by the Kosa people. For example, in the language of the Zulus, an ancestral spirit is called Idlos. But if you use that word to a Kosa, he says you are using a dirty word because to them Idlos means sexual desire. And in the language of the Zulus, milimil, maize mil, is known as impup. But in the language of the Babedis, maize mil is called bupi. And if a Zulu uses the word impup in front of a Babedi woman, she feels that he has insulted her because in the Babedi language, impupu means a woman's sexual organ. And in the language of the Mashonas, in the language of the Zulus, sorry, a mother is called Mama. If I say my mother, I say Mama Wami. But in the language of the Mashona, the people of Eastern Zimbabwe. The word mama means to sit down and have a crap. So one day when I said to my Mashona hosts, Gikumbule umama, which means, which in Zulu is, I remember my mother, I'm missing my mother. The Mashona gentleman immediately took me and directed me to his pit latrine at the back of his house. <laughs> because in the Mashona way, mother is my, not mom. So you see this terrible difficulty, this subtle problem of language is, all, is a very big uh, 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 obstacle to communication in Africa. So we designed languages. There's another language called Fanagalo, 
which is a lingua franca consisting of African words as well as nonsense words and, and Zulu words, which was used a lot in the mines in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. So to bridge this great language gap, we have created lang artificial languages in Africa, and but today English is the preferred language of communication. Some say we should learn French, also another language of communication in Africa. Some of you know the problems of language uh, can be uh, funny, but um, it, it is the same situation, the divide and rule, that is actually, in, in other expressions, created this tremendous turmoil in Africa and other places in the world. Yes. And we're, we're looking, from my research, and staggeringly hearing uh, you talk, you're saying exactly the same as I've come across. It's incredible confirmation that a reptilian race from another world has been behind the manipulation of humanity for a very, very long time. Now, what do these Chittahuli actually look like, the reptiles? I'm not a good artist. You're better than me, that's for sure. But this is how we believe the Chittahuli look like. They were created in this... You, you see, sir, you white people, say that there are alien beings on this earth. No, you are wrong. The earth in which we live has produced 24 different races during its long existence. Please, this is how a Chitauli looks like. It stands about 11 feet high it is a very slender being which seems not to have a bone structure. Its, its fingers have no joints. They are more like, they are more as if the bones in here were flexible. It, uh, some of the Chitauri have got three claws with a thumb. Some have got six claws with a thumb. And some of the Chitauris have got horns on their heads. And what surprises me is this. Some film producers, like the producers whom who make the films Star Wars George Lucas. often show creatures in their films which actually exist, which even the most uneducated of Africans who knows this Chitauli can identify. For example, in the new Star Wars film, what is it called? Star Wars or something like that, there is a creature who amazes me called Darth Maul. Darth Maul is a red and black being with a ring of small horns right round his head. That is exactly what the Chitawuli look like. Some have got ordinary heads without any horns on their on their on their heads. These are the lesser chitaul. But the royal chitaul have got a ring of sharp horns all around their heads. And the very high chitaul, like their king Mubaba Samahongo, they have got very long horns which grow this way, not that way like a bull, but this way like certain antelopes. Now, I wonder, I just wonder, 
where these film producers get their information from. And in, in one strange film, which my student told, called me to come and watch, the, the thing called Stargate 2. Mm -hmm. And in that film, there was a creature a very slimy, cream-colored creature with heavy wrinkles on its face. It was a spitting likeness of Mubaba Samahongo, the terrible emperor of the Chitaul. Well, clearly there's a tremendous amount of, of knowledge um, of what's been going on and what is going on, which comes out symbolically through uh, films and uh, areas of uh, communication like um, Hollywood. But the thing that I, I'm totally stunned the more I, I talk to you about this is because I've been uh, all over the world having people give me descriptions of seeing um, uh, reptilian type figures, particularly people in positions of power in the world, uh, changing into a reptilian figure and coming back again. And what they describe seeing is exactly what the knowledge of ancient Africa talks about seeing. We're talking about the same people there, which is an astonishing uh, yes. confirmation. It, and the eyes is something that keeps coming up being described. Yes. Tell me about the eyes of the Chittahuli. Say, a warrior Chittahuli has got eyes like a snake. These eyes are yellowish with split pupils and they glow in darkness. So if a Chitauri, a warrior Chitauri, one of the lesser, lesser classes, is hiding in a cave, you can see its eyes burning. But a royal Chitauri has got three eyes. It's got the yellow eyes, which glow in a strange, almost ice-like way like jewels, like certain types of yellow jewel. And then they have got an eye in the center of their foreheads, an eye which doesn't close up down like a normal eye does, but which closes from side to side and which opens this way. Now this eye of the Chitaur is the eye that kills because it can knock a man down just by the fire, the glare that comes out of it. Is this where the um, a constant recurring theme of the evil eye comes from? Yes, yes. In fact, Mubaba, the emperor of the, of the Chitauri, who is said to be still alive today, Mubaba has got a central eye his other two eyes were stitched shut by a jealous wife. But his killing eye, the summer hongo, the terrible red eye, opens. He can even open it like this. Mr. David, I would like to share a little thing with you. It is this. The best way to protect an evil thing is to deny its existence. And if you talk about things such as the Chitauri, if you talk about things such as the Mandinda, there are many people who say to you, rubbish, this thing does not exist. Now, in this way, this great evil is protected by being denied. One day in my long travels through the world, I, I was in New York in that place called Harlem, and I saw a graffito on a wall along a, a passage and the graffito was, 
there is no such a thing as the mafia and we will kill any asshole who says that there is. In this, again and again, say, in America, people deny the existence of the mafia and by denying it, actually protect it wittingly or unwittingly. There are those who deny that a national and international conspiracy exists. They deny it ferociously, but by denying it, they are actually assisting it and actually protecting it. We must stop denying the existence of these things. We must stop saying that there are no Chitao that there are no aliens, that there are no Illuminati. There are. I could tell you for hours, for example, do you know what we Zulu people call a person, a very, very clever person, a very, very wise person, a person who has received light from God, we call him Umkanyiselwa, in other words, the illuminated one. Kanyisa means to, to, to light up something. And Umkanyiselwa is somebody who has been lighted up by the gods. So you say Illuminati, I say Umkanyiselwa. It's the same thing. And my research, uh, very clearly, um, and again, you're right, there's tremendous denial that this is the fact, um, even among conspiracy researchers there's tremendous denial, that the Chittahuli, the reptilians, and the Illuminati are actually the same thing. Exactly, sir. Because amongst my people, we say that when two Chittahuli are challenging each other for power, and they must fight a duel with their terrible eyes. They start glowing like fishes deep in the, in the sea. And the f faster they glow, the angrier they, they, they are said to be. Now that is why there are certain parts of Africa where people are advised not to walk at night because that is where the Chitauri often fight. And one of these parts of Africa, say, is a remarkable place called the Mountains of the Round Rocks, Matobo, wrongly pronounced Matopo in, in Zimbabwe. These hills are really not remarkable in themselves. These hills are, are said to be the one place in Africa where the Chitauri have been seen. And these hills uh, is where Cecil John Rhodes lies buried, but there is more. You must visit this place at one time. Amongst the rocks on the Matopo mountains, you find a species of lizard which you don't find anywhere in Africa or the world. A species of lizard which responds to the call of a human being. When I first arrived in 1958 in the land called Rhodesia, now known as Zimbabwe, I found an African there who was a tourist attraction. He was a game warden who made strange sounds calling out and as he called out these strange lizards, the only type of lizard anywhere on earth which responds to, to the human voice used to come out of cracks and out of holes in the ground 
and to gather around this African. And it was this African game warden who told me that the, sh the sounds he is making are not just noise, they are the speech of the Chitauri star gods. Isn't it a staggering coincidence that Cecil Rhodes, one of the greatest Illuminati frontmen, uh, perhaps of, of, of certainly of modern times, who did so much to imprison Africa, should choose to be buried at the point where this is all going on? You see, sir, Cecil John Rhodes wormed his way into the hearts of Africans and in their despair, wise men of the Mashona people, wise men of Matebele people, tried to make Cecil John Rhodes one of them. They told him about the secrets of the Matopo Mountains, that under the Matopo Mountains lies a city, a city of great wisdom, which is the home of the last survivors of the Chitauri god beings in that part of Africa. And if you go to the Matopo Mountains and you carry a four-pound hammer and you strike certain parts of that landscape with that hammer, it gives out a hollow sound which shows you that there are caverns deep underground there. There are two sets of mountains. There is the Matopo Mountains, and then to the east of Zimbabwe, there are the great mountains known as the Inyangani, the Weeping Moon Mountains. There, even now, people disappear without trace. Sometimes, a person would disappear for several days and reappear a few days later, not knowing where he had been or where she had been. And white people have disappeared there. Black people in their thousands have disappeared there. It was there that I also went missing for four days in 1959 in one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. What happened? Well, it's a long story, sir. My teacher, Elizabeth Moyo, had sent me to get a special a herb which grows only on the foothills of those mountains. It was just an ordinary day like any other, just beautiful day like this one outside here. And I I love the African wilderness. I'm at home in the bush, especially in the days when I was still in good health. I love the animals, I, still, I love the, their smell, and I love the smell of the vegetation. And I was looking for this herb when all of a sudden a, a bright blue mist fell all around me. It took me some time to react to this strange thing. It was a hot day and all of a sudden the temperature around me dropped. It was as if I was on the slope of a very cold mountain. But it was a warm day. And then the next moment I was in what appeared to be a metal-lined tunnel, a caving tunnel. And I was lying on what looked like a workbench, a very large uh, workbench of some kind. You know, a, an iron table which uh, uh, an engineer or somebody working with metal would use to, uh, for welding and cutting metal upon. But this workbench was very brightly polished. And there I was lying there with my trousers missing and only my khaki shirt, when I saw again through what appeared to be like blue mist, a number of moving objects, which at first I thought were dolls. And these objects 
were moving towards me. I noticed to, with mild surprise that they were very thin, short, human-like creatures with very, very large melon-shaped heads. The creatures had no noses, they, like hum as human beings have. They had only small little holes on either side of where the nose would be, and their mouths were like knife cuts at the bottom of their faces. And these creatures were coming towards me. In color, they were gray like certain uh, types of fish, and they wore silvery gray garments which reached up to their necks and up to their wrists. I couldn't see whether they were wearing boots or not at that time. And while I was looking at these creatures, I suddenly was aware that something was above me, standing there, and I looked up straight into the face of one of them, a much taller one than the others. And this creature was wearing a garment, like a tight-fitting overall, without any buttons or anything, which reached up to its neck, but its wrists were bare. I noticed that the creature said, had very long fingers. Its fingers had extra, and each of its fingers had an extra joint and it ended in a claw, a black claw like that of a, a chicken or a certain kind of bird, and that its thumb was not here, but here in the middle of the hand. And this thing was standing above my head and looking down at me, and I was looking at its eyes, which were very strange indeed. It was as if it was wearing plastic goggles over its eyes. I could see its eyes inside these tinted goggles, and it had holes on either side here, but it had no nose as I have. Its jaws were very small, and its mouth was a slit with tiny little scale-like things where its lips should be. And the creature carried a horrible smell on it. I can't describe that smell. It was a metallic, chemical smell like, which seemed to combine the smell you would smell when somebody is burning brass or copper and a very ugly chemical smell. These two smells combined. And this creature was looking down at me. I was frightened, but I could not move. And the next thing I knew was a terrible pain on my left thigh. It was as if somebody had just stabbed me right to the bone. I screamed and I tried to jump away, but my body was my body was inactive. I could not move. I was not tied to any chain. I was not chained to the top of this table. There was no belt tying me, but I could not move my body. And when I looked down at what was happening, I found that one of the shorter creatures had driven something very painful into my left thigh. And then, while I watched, horrified, the creature pulled out this thing, and I saw that it was like a pencil made of shining metal with what appeared to be a flexible uh, uh, cable at the back. And before I could do anything, sir, my head was seized by the creature above me. 
it caught me on either side of the head like like this and then a fourth a second third creature drove something into my right nostril here it was as if i had been shot the pain was so terrible sir, that i screamed and screamed blood filled my mouth blood spattered out of the nostril and the creature did not seem to care i was i was stupefied the pain was so intense so terrible and then quietly brutally the creature pulled out the thing that it had stabbed in me in the nose with and blood flowed into my mouth into 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 out of my nostril and i was choking and then the big creature coldly turned my head this way so that blood came out of the mouth and which gave me some kind of relief and after what seemed like an eternity of pain the the creature brought something out of somewhere which looked it looked like a an old fashioned tea strainer in appearance and it put this thing close to my nose and then i seemed to drift away and the pain subsided you know sir it was torture so intense that even now i can't describe it and then something else happened a fourth creature started rummaging between my legs and it pulled out my organ of manhood and stuck something into that it was very strange but i wasn't feeling any pain now but i could feel the the flexible cable moving inside me right into my body and then ugh, i can't describe it it was as if my seed was being sucked out by this small bright flexible cable and then the creature just pulled it out I screamed and I cried and I screamed but I could not move and then something happened which to this day still amazes me after the creature had pulled out the flexible cable from my organ the creature just stood there looking at my organ and I was so terrified that I urinated and accidentally urinated against the chest of the creature. It jumped away as if I had shot it and it stumbled backwards. It but its face didn't show any expression. Its mouth didn't even open, but the way the creature reacted trembling all over, it was as if I had really hit it, but it was wearing this kind of garment and after that sir, i was left alone except for the big creature which stood to one to my right side this time with its arms folded looking down at me and then while i was looking at this creature trying to appeal to it no pain anymore no pain please I was pleading pictures suddenly flooded my mind pictures of buildings sunk in a red in a red lake of of water buildings rotting away buildings that appeared as if they had been bombed and cities sunk in terrible mud trees sticking out like rotten ghosts trees without leaves without branches sticking out of the mud 
as if they had been poisoned. I saw visions of this. And then, through an entrance which I had not seen before, came a strange and terrible being. It was exactly like this. It was tall, made entirely of metal, with burning eyes and a snout. It didn't do anything. It just moved and came to stand at my left side. It didn't touch me or anything like that. It just stood there, making a strange humming sound. Wow, 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 like that. And then, say, from behind this metal creature, there appeared another creature. It was so radically different from the grey creatures in that it looked exactly like an earthly human being. It had a pink skin like that of an, a, a white woman. It had golden hair and its ears were definitely pointed like those of an animal. Its eyes were slightly slanting. They were pale, pale blue, and never once did they blink. It was like this, nude, and there was a tail-like appendage at its back, which was very visible as it walked away after it had done to me what it did. What this thing did, it climbed over me and made love to me. And I noticed that unlike normal women, its breasts were set too high in its chest and they were very, very hard in appearance. And that here, the pubic hair as well as the hair in the armpits was a fiery red as if it had been dyed. And this thing didn't even blink. Its eyes were just like this, looking at you as if the, she, there, were no, there was no liquid in the eyes. Just an unblinking, terrible stare. And it was a small creature about the size of a 16-year-old girl. But it was very, very heavy as it sat on top of me. And there was no emotion in that whole nonsense. There was no, you know, I, I just... And then the creatures took me out of that room after the metal creature and this pink creature had gone. This creature took me out of that room, assisted by another one. And they pushed me along a corridor which curved slowly in that direction, in, in the, towards my right. And there I was shown many things which even today I don't understand. I was shown little versions of this creature swimming in huge cylinders of what made out of what looked like glass in a pink, pinkish liquid like ugly little ted, little frogs inside the liquid. They looked like, like aborted human fetuses. They were very, very terrible and disgusting. And then we came to another room and there I saw a number of people undergoing the same torture that I had undergone. One particular person who, whom I passed very close to was a white man, definitely a European, with a yellowish beard and moustache and long 
straggly blood, blood crusted hair. This man looked into my eyes and I looked into his eyes and we were so, so close we were as I went past him. Then, to cut a long story short, I found myself in the bush again. But, but I was wearing only my shirt. My boots were gone and so was my trousers. So I took off my shirt and wore it around my waist as a, a, a loincloth. And I started traveling, not knowing really in which direction I was going. Then I came to a track and I walked along that and some time later I saw people coming towards me. It was a group of young men and young women, Mashona people, and they were going to a trading store, I later learned. I asked them where Elizabeth Moyo's homestead was and they directed me to it, but they kept a safe distance away from me. And later I, I learned why. I was carrying a horrible non-human smell upon me. When at long last I came to Mrs. Moyo's village, all the dogs in that place went hysterical. They came at me in a pack wanting to tear me to pieces and only the villagers managed to save my life then. Mrs. Simoyo asked me where I had been and I said I did not know. And then she said, I know you, have, you had been taken by the little ones. I said, yes, I cannot understand. She said, you must not try to understand. You were chosen by the gods as a living sacrifice. So don't even try to talk about this. But how could I not talk about it? I wanted to understand what had been done to me, by whom and why. Even now, sir, I still want to understand what it was all about. And Many years later, I met a remarkable white woman, Elizabeth Clara, a famous South African woman who had worked for British intelligence during the war and who, we are told, had been impregnated by a being from the stars, Akko. I asked Elizabeth what what was the meaning of the strange thing which was done to me? Because since that time, I had come across many black people, well over 200, who had been through the same torture as I. I had come across many black as well as Cape colored women who had been mysteriously impregnated by the same creatures that I had gone through the hands of. And let me tell you one other interesting thing sir, before I forget. About a year after I had underwent this terrible experience, I was walking along Jeppe Street in Johannesburg delivering parcels when a white man shouted at me to stop. I stopped. I thought he was a policeman wanting to arrest me for some reason. And when I tried to produce my identity document, the white man said, listen, I don't want your nasty word, passbook, kefa. I said, then sir, what do you want, boss? He said, listen, where did I see you? Where did I see you? I said, I don't know, boss. 
but I, he looked very familiar to me. And then he said, listen, don't bullshit me, man. Where did I see you? Where did you and I meet? Then I said to him, I saw you in Rhodesia, in a certain place. You were lying on a table. If I had hit that white man with a fist, he would not have reacted the way he did. He went pale, almost dirty gray in appearance. And he turned away with a terrible dirty word and he walked away. His eyes were filled not with anger, say, but with pure naked terror. Astonishing story. Yes. But there is more, say. There is more because I still want to know what was done to me. Say, one day you and I must talk more in greater depth than now. I would like, I would like to tell you that since that time I have found that I know things that, that a man of my standard of education does, shouldn't know. These hands, and those who know me can confirm this, these hands not only have made these sculptures using ancient African metal casting secrets, these hands believe it or not, can make guns and working jet engines. And one day I wish you to come back to South Africa and I will show you one of these things. I know things which I shouldn't know and it started at that time. Now, you see, sir, I don't, I want to know what am I, since that terrible time, my life as a man was really messed up. And one day I will, t let me tell you, sir, since that time, I have become a very confused creature. It's very, it's very, it's embarrassing really. But since that terrible day, I became bisexual, which to me as an African is very, very disgusting. Since that time, my mind is, doesn't seem to be my own. I think about things that a man like me shouldn't bother himself about. I worry about people. I, it's sickening. Sir. I have ruined my life because of worrying about people. I feel that I, could, I want to shake, ev to take every human being on this earth by the shoulders shake them roughly and say, listen, pastor, there is more to this earth than you think. Say, I have seen the chitaul. I have smelt them. I have, I have had personal experience of these. And there are people who claim that these creatures are gods. There are people, say, who claim that these creatures are experimenting on us. That is a lot of rubbish. These creatures are harvesting us. These creatures are not aliens, Mr. Ike. These creatures are sexually compatible with our women. And what does that tell you? It tells you that they came from here. 
they are they are they are part of us and this makes them all the more dangerous they know us very 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 well they know the great weaknesses of our minds just as they know the great strengths of our minds they operate in in what i call the gray area of human existence that ta- that side of our lives which we don't want to acknowledge the existence of they create african tradition says that the chitawuli where 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 they engaged god himself in a terrible war and god defeated them the real god ngulunkulu the creator god defeated them and he closed their mouths so that they are unable to talk or to eat food anymore but we are told say that the chitawuli fatten on the energy that we human beings give them they make us to fight each other and when the whole land is drowning in death and fear and terror when hundreds and hundreds of people are angry and afraid the cheetah will get fat because they eat that that what we call the dark power which is brought about when human beings destroy the planet on which they live they feed off human emotion yes sir. very very intense human emotion for we are told for example that if you see a chitawuri walking through the bush or just standing there and looking at you and you are accompanied by your wife or your girlfriend you must immediately make love to that girlfriend and release as much emotion as possible and the chitawuri will be pleased and will walk away from you and not harm you and another thing say we are told that the chitawuri it energy which is generated when hundreds of human minds or one human mind starts thinking at certain levels we are told that the chitawuri want us to think at certain levels certain wavelengths yes sir. and they reward us with long life may i ask you sir have you ever thought as a thinking person why is it that in the great universities of this world you find professors who think at certain levels and who live unnaturally long lives Albert Einstein Raymond Dart Robert Broom all these professors live a long long time and my aunt mine the last sanusi in South Africa other than myself is as active as a young girl and yet she is close to her 99th year of life my stepmother rose she has lost nearly all his her children and she is still alive extreme longevity is the reward with which the chitawuri reward you if you think at certain wavelengths the description of your abduction clearly is describing what has become known as the grays what i think is also known by some as the ant people the 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 gray figures with the big black eyes how do you think they connect in with the 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 openly reptilian and do you think that the 
the black covers of the eyes are, are covering uh, some kind of reptilian <laughs> truth. See, the so-called grey aliens are actually the lackeys and the servants of the Chitauri. If you see a Chitauri and you see this, there is a very little racial difference. In fact, I will even go so far as to say this, that these creatures are actually the offspring of the Chitauri. The way they gather substances from human beings and from animals, the way they are the forerunners of the Chitauri in any place. And if you look, if you are very close to one of these creatures and you look into its goggle-like eyes, you will see round eyes, Mr. Ike, beyond this black goggle-like stuff. And these eyes are the real creature's eyes. Now let me tell you, there is in Lesotho a very strange mountain, a mountain called Leribe, L-E-R-I-B-E. -E. On this mountain, very amazing things happen after every 10-year or 20-year period. Now, not so long ago, an African farmer found an object near that mountain, an object which had crashed. And he was driving his tractor, and he saw this strange object lying on, in the ground with tiny little bolts of lightning uh, uh, racing all around its 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 edge and the african walked up to the to the to the object and when he wanted to touch it a strange power struck him and sent him sprawling on his back to the ground the african got onto his got up got onto his tractor and got out of there what the african had seen had been a crashed UFO, a flying saucer. He described it very amazingly. And he said that after a few days, there appeared what he said was a huge removal van, very big, accompanied by soldiers wearing black, black uniforms, goggles, and barrettes. And these soldiers lifted the object into the van, and the van drove away. But when people came to the site, they saw that something had fallen there, but they saw no heavy tires tire tracks of the vehicle that the man had described. Something had crashed there, had been removed, but there were no wheel marks of the heavy vehicle he had described. Now let me tell you something else. It was in 1958 In fact, I think that the incidents, um, the incident I'm going to describe to you, sir, is somehow connected to what happened to me in 1959. I'm sure of it. A friend of mine in Lesotho called me. He said that he had something very important and that we had to share this. 
He said, please, I must come to Lesotho. I must come. And I went there. And then I found that he had dug a hole at the back of his heart. And he asked me that he and I and his second wife should go into this hole on the night to come and there to share something very, very holy. Well, we went down the hole. We used a, 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 a broken ladder. And there inside the hole, we ate small pieces of something. He told me to chew these things very thoroughly, as they were quite hard. I still had teeth in my face at that time. And I chewed and I chewed and I chewed and I chewed. But I noticed that what I was chewing was some kind of dry substance and that it had the same taste that you, you would feel in your mouth if you sucked a copper penny. It had that coppery taste, like as if you were sucking an old copper coin. And then we left the hole and we went into his house. And on the following day, we all became terribly ill, very, very ill. Our skins erupted into a rush. It was very, very painful. It was very, very itchy. We bathed with urine, trying to get, take the itching away, but it failed. We bathed with sheep deep, and it failed. And in the end, I could no longer breathe at all. My tongue appeared to swell many times its size. And then I got so sick I could barely open my eyelids. The skin was itching like murder and I could barely breathe. And as the days went by, it was about a week, but it seemed like a hundred years, Slowly the rush subsided and my skin began to peel as did my friend's skin and the skin of his wife. We were very, very, very sick. And when I could speak, I asked him, what was the thing that you you, you gave me to eat. This is the thing that has made us so sick. Why did you do this, my friend? He said, look, what we shared was something that can only be eaten while you are hiding in a hole. And that thing is the flesh of a god. I said, god? He said, yes. I said, but I am sick now. He said, wait, wait, you'll recover. You either die within two days or you recover. Now we are going to recover because we are still alive after two days. Mr. Ick, I can't describe to you what happened next. I wish you to imagine, sir, you are sick, weak, and feverish. Suddenly, you get stuck, staring, raving, laughing mad. We started laughing. <laughs> it, it was utterly incredible. What had made us to, to, what had caused the laughter, we did not know, but we laughed for hours, all three of us. And then 
when our jaws couldn't laugh anymore, a new thing happened. My friend's eldest daughter gave us all water. And when I drank that water, my sense of taste was so heightened that I was utterly shaken. Ordinary water from a, a mountain spring tasted like, I don't know, like what? Like wine, like something out of I don't know where. My taste buds must have been souped up somehow. And then another feeling, which I cannot describe, fell over all of us. It was a feeling as if we were one with, with the entire universe. When I looked at a tree outside my friend's homestead, it was as if that tree was a multicolored living rainbow. When I looked at the mountain far away, my sense of sight was so intense that I could see colors beyond colors. I can't give you any other description. And then say, afterwards, I was very weak, but with a monstrous appetite. And then I left my friend's homestead and returned to South Africa. Every step of the way, I seemed like a person reborn. It was a feeling that no words can describe. And when I asked my friend by letter afterwards, what was this God flesh? He said it had been the flesh of a Puana. What we call dread. Yes, sir. People who say that these things don't exist had better think again. They are tangible, they are smellable, and furthermore, they are edible if you are willing to take the risk. In Africa, we have an ancient custom whose existence many people deny today that anything that, aim, that claims to be a god should be eaten. There are places in Africa even now where if you are a spiritual person and you are sick, well, let me tell you what happened to me in the country today called Zaire. I got six. I was undergoing yet another of my seven initiations. And I fell sick from very bad running stomach. And I was so sick. Everything that my friends, white friends and black friends could do failed to help me. And then, one night, some of my teachers came to me and requested that since I was going to die, would I please allow them the honor of eating me after death? Now, say, I, it's a very good thing to be invited to a dinner but not when you happen to be part of the menu. And I recovered so quickly that I escaped from that area in one of their ramshackle buses, and I never went back. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fear can be a wonderful medicine sometimes, <laughs> and it was with me. Do you think, Credo, that those senses that you experience, that really heightened sense of everything, of oneness, of whatever, are the very senses that the Chittahuli have manipulated out of us. I do, sir. I do very much. They were, they were senses like, like no human being possesses. 
may I add, no human being possesses anymore. They, it was as if at one time, say, a voice was speaking in my head, a very amazing voice. And after that, my powers of prophecy were intensified. This is what I think. We human beings are holier and more wonderful than we think we are. And I feel we lost something at some time in the course of our development, or shall I say, in the course of our our manipulation. Fredo, this is fascinating information, um, uh, which I'm sure many people in the UFO research um, community will be um, very, very interested in. That is that these grey extraterrestrials, or grey figures, whatever they are, don't actually really look like that. They're almost in disguise. Yes, sir, they are. And I will tell you why. Grey aliens have died in, in various parts of Africa. They have been killed, and they are very, very quick to recover the bodies of their friends, which have fallen out of their crashed spacecraft. But Sometimes African Sangomas steal these bodies before they can be recovered. And believe me, sir, I have heard and I have seen that butchering a corpse of one of these creatures is extremely hard work. What do you think is the skin of the creature? is actually a tight-fitting costume that the creature is wearing. Under this, under this grey costume, the creature, say, is pinkish-white, like a freshly skinned animal, and its eyes are round with split pupils. These are goggles which the creature is wearing. Now, how do I know that? In order to dismember a creature like this, incidentally we call them mandindane in Zulu, which means the tormentors, the torturers. In order to dismember a creature like this, you need a brand new axe from the trading store, a heavy axe sharpened to a razor's edge in order to cut through the creature's skin. The creature's skin, say, is not adhering to the flesh. You know, my skin is clinging to my flesh, yes? But the creature, there is a gap between the creature's flesh and its supposed skin. This is a material and not a skin. So the creature is actually wearing two garments. It's wearing a completely skin-tight garment which covers its entire body. And it is wearing an overall along these lines. Very often there are no gloves. And here, to cut up a mandindane, you need very, very sharp iron. And you have got to be a strong person even to reach its flesh. But once you have cut through the cover, the close fitting covering, you can just open the whole thing and see the dead creature's flesh underneath it. And is it reptilian? Yes, sir. It is, I will tell you how the creature looks like without its gray skin. It is like certain types of tropical fish. It's like the, the belly of that type of fish that is fried in South Africa to make fish and chips. That gray, gray fish, that long gray fish. The texture of its real skin is like that, 
but the blood vessels are very close to the surface. In fact, not so long ago, Mr. Ike, right here in South Africa, several hundred school children, some black, some colored, were terrorized by a creature they called Pinky Pinky, a creature which looked as if it had been skinned alive. That was a mantindarn without its skin or costume. It's interesting when you're talking about the, the black eyes of these greys um, being a cover for something, and then you have the stories of the men in black who seem to interact not very positively, to say the least, with people involved in UFO and UFO investigation and stuff. Um, and, and these men in black have these black goggle-like sunglasses, which are almost a mirror of the same. Exactly, sir. But let me tell you that over this, the last hundred years or so, the men in black have become westernized, in Africa at least. In old Africa, if you killed a Mandindan, one of these, you were visited by terrible beings who wore long black robes made of animal skin and deep hoods over their heads. And these creatures used to wear white masks with a very, very terrible looking black eyes painted on them. They were called Izilo Zengubo, the beasts of the blanket. And may I tell you, that these terrible beings, our African version of the men in black, used to play an important part in the choosing of certain kings in South Africa. That is one of the stories that I wish to tell you in greater detail one day. Whenever you have harmed a Mandinda, you received a visit from men in black. And one of my uncles was a night watchman just after the Second World War. And he saw what he thought was a burglar breaking into a factory which stored surplus uh, army property. And he threw his nobgiri at this figure and hit it very hard. The creature fell behind some boxes, and then and only then did my uncle, a tough old Zulu, realize that the thing he had brought down was not a human being at all, not a young thief, but a Mandindan. My uncle threw down his second stick and ran screaming out of the factory. And not long after that, because my uncle had taken from the creature what he thought was its bag, he took the bag with him to Alexander Township after he had run out of the factory, but he could not open the bag. And while he was sitting in the, in the shack in Alexander Township, in just near Johannesburg, there arrived at his shack two white men who posed as detectives. And these so-called detectives told my, my, my uncle's common law wife that she must give to them the bag that my uncle had taken from the little man. And she did, and they vanished. What I'm trying to say, Mr. Ike, is the richer we become, the more we behave as the Chitauli are said to behave. 
some of us, when they acquire a lot of wealth, start consuming metals and other minerals that they really do not need, which, however, if you study the story of the Chitauri, you are told that the Chitauri use these minerals and metals as medicine. We are told, say, that the Chitauri, when they get sick, smear their bodies with gold dust, which gets absorbed into their skins and they become all right. May I point out, it was once the custom of the Munumutapa kings of Zimbabwe, the men who built the Zimbabwe ruins, that on certain rising of the, the day star, the priest king would be smeared from head to foot with gold dust, and sometimes he was ritually sacrificed on the top of the wall of the Zimbabwe fortress. And to my amazement, when I visited South America, I found that the ancient Mayans had exactly the same custom where a god king was smeared with a mixture of fat and gold dust. And, and I, I know from my own research that the Maya people and the Central and South American people have a massive uh, accounts and legends of the same reptilian gods. Yes, sir. The, the thing is, if you read the ancient stories of our people or you listen to them spoken by the storytellers, you find that hu we human beings are somehow programmed to alter the world in which we live and render it uninhabitable to ourselves. We are told, say, by the griots of Nigeria, by the griots of the Dogon people, that at one time, a few thousand years ago almost, the entire Sahara Desert was not a desert at all. In fact, Photographs have been taken of the certain parts of the Sahara from high up which show ancient irrigation systems where there is now wind-blown desert. Question, sir, are we being used as instruments for the destruction of our own species? I say yes. The wealthier a person is, the more like a chitauri he or she behaves. Some wealthy people even go to the extent of throwing away their old spouses and acquiring new ones, exactly as King, uh, King Samahongo of the, of the chitauri does. He, he kills and eats all his wives when they can no longer make love to him properly and he acquires new ones. He killed and ate 36 of his wives over a long reign and only one wife was cunning enough to keep out of his glitches. You, you see millionaires divorcing their wives and acquiring new wives, and the Chitauri, unlike traditional Africans, believe that a female is inferior to the male, and so do the wealthy people who, 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 who acquire great wealth in this world. They tend to look down upon women and even to abuse them. Well, let's connect this into the present day um, and one thing that is um, a constant reoccurring theme is the 
reptilians or an extraterrestrial race interbreeding with humanity and creating particular bloodlines. And you've got an amazing um, ar artifact, I guess that's the word, uh, necklace here, which I know is incredibly heavy, which um, has a very significant contribution to make to this theme of extraterrestrials or another race, not human, interbreeding with humanity. Now, first of all, wh where did this come from? Sir, we don't know. This necklace has been around for so long that we don't exactly know from which tribe it came. All I can tell you is that this necklace was in existence when the king who founded the Zulu nation, Zulu, was still a boy. It is described in ancient legends centering around this king. It is called Ingweba Yezimfilo, the necklace of the mysteries. It is really a book which tells 12 different stories. And how old do you think it is? How long do you, how old do you know it is, first of all? I don't know, sir. All I do know is that... Hundreds of years, sir? Yes. Yes, very old. But it's not as old as the green face that I've just shown you. Oh, the cheetah The cheetah face sir, is said to be over 7,000 years old, this thing here. Now, this necklace enshrine several mysteries in it. Inside here are stones which are not from this earth. It is a very amazing story. There are three pebbles in here which stories say were brought to this earth by an alien baby which played with a human baby in the northern Transvaal. This, first of all, that, that looks so much, just well, it's, it obviously looks very much like a, like a, a spacecraft. A man, man done it, yeah. Yes, sir. This, this half molten object here used to be a serpent like necklace worn by a Mashona chief. He went to investigate something which had landed in the bush and which was killing his people. And he went with his battle axe to attack this object. And the object blew a jet of very terrible fire at the chief. And he, he became just smoke. And this was all that was left of him. Now, this necklace enshrines one of the oldest and the greatest mysteries in our country. That the, the God beings which we call by the name Chidauri and which are called Zishwezi or Imanugela in the languages of other tribes throughout Africa. These gods came down to the earth in great uh, 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 vessels made out of gold and they united with female human beings to create a race of kings and queens on our earth. There isn't a tribe, Mr. Ike, anywhere in Africa. And when you return to South Africa, I will ask you to investigate this very closely. There isn't a tribe anywhere in Southern Central, Western, and Eastern Africa, which doesn't claim that kingship 
was a system that was brought down from the sky by gods who either traveled in swings, as the pygmies of Zaire say, or who came down in huge vessels which were shaped like bows, vessels made of gold, vessels bigger than mountains. I wish to share these things with you, say, as briefly as I can. The Zulu people believed that they originated from space, and their name Zulu does not mean sky, but rather interplanetary space. And the word Zulu also has to do with traveling. For example, if I say to a child, you are getting about, you are moving from village to village lazily, I say, we are Zula, when? Now the word Zula, which is used to refer to Zulus, sometimes contemptuously, in Zula, means really a traveler, a voyager, somebody moving from place to place. Where? In the Izu. Now I ask you, how did a land-bound people like the Zulus know that you could travel in space? We are Zula, a Zuluini. You can travel in the great place of traveling. For that matter, Zulu people knew that the earth was a sphere and that it was the sun that was still in space and the various planets orbited around it. I will show you on the other necklace of knowledge. And when a Zulu refers to the earth, he says, umhlaba jigelele. Now, the word jigelele implies a spherical or a hemispherical object. But a Musutu or a Mutswana from Lesotho or from Botswana will refer to the world as Lifazi, which means that which is down here. And he will say, when he refers to the Earth's shape, Lifazi ka bupara. Now this word ka bupara means the Earth in its width. Thus, a Musutu or a Mutswana believes that the earth is flat, but the Zulus believe it is either a hemisphere or a sphere. The Zulu people were the first people to know something that is now attributed to Albert Einstein, namely that Space and time are one and the same thing. Zulus knew that long before Einstein was born. They said that one other Zulu name for space is Umkati. Umkati. U-M-K-H-A-T-H-I. Umkati. And they called time easy card. So you can see sir, that Zulus, supposedly a nation of skin-wearing primitives, were aware of the fact that space and time are one and the same thing. And further, that if you could find the river of time, you could travel into the future and into the past. And many are the ancient legends which are told in Zululand of a man who traveled to through time and accidentally killed a young boy who turned out to be himself in the past. And so 
he no longer existed anymore. There's an indication on the necklace, uh, I know, uh, around the back that the earth is round. One of the symbols is indicating that, or a sphere. Yes. But I, I wonder what you um, think, uh, Credo, of what is taught to children and students all over the world in the universities and the fancy academic centers, that actually we are now at the cutting edge of human evolution in terms of technological knowledge and knowledge of the world and the universe. And in fact, um, back in the um, ancient world in Africa and North Africa and all over South America, they were just a primitive people. Please, that is a lot of poppycock. In fact, in my long investigation into our past, I can tell you proudly that our ancestors were 20 times cleverer than we are. What I feel and what I think say, is that in the past, human beings were cleverer than we are today. And that human beings knew more than we know now. We are not progressing, Mr. Ike. We are simply rediscovering things that were known by better men and better women than we are thousands of years ago. I wish to offer you proof of this, some of it at least. Say, there are things that I have found in my travel through the world, things that prove to me that our ancestors were highly advanced in chemistry. Our ancestors had become so clever that they could, they could take science and reduce it to such a simple level that they were able to help hundreds of starving human beings after some traumatic happening in the past. Let's um, concentrate on some of the images on the yes. necklace and the symbols, because that leaves no doubt that a lot of knowledge has been around for a very much longer time than, than yes. we are ever told. First of all, on the hand, I'm seeing uh, the eye. Now, the all-seeing eye and the, uh, the symbol of the eye is one the Illuminati use all the time. And it's one, of course, that was a very big symbol of ancient Egypt, the Eye of Ra and what have you. Why is that eye there on that hand? That represents the terrible eye of the Chitawuli, the eye which sees everything, the eye which knows everything. It is said that when a Chitawuli dies, he passes his dead eye onto his next of kin. And to the Chitauli, an eye is a very, very powerful symbol. This is the eye of the Chitauli. And, but there is more to this thing. Sir. Here there is a hole that goes right through the copper. Now if you put water in that hole, you end up with a a simple magnifying microscope and you can see gems through that water. The magnification is amazing. The, the great symbol is pointed out again and again um, on the dollar bill, which is on the reverse of the Great Seal of the United States, yes, put on there by the Illuminati, a president called Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, is the all-seeing eye. Um, and so is it your understanding that the all-seeing eye, when it's used by the Illuminati, represents this third eye of the Chetahuli. Yes, I do. I really am sure of this. Why? Because in Africa, even ordinary human eyes are regarded as very powerful devices of magic. If an African shows you respect, he mustn't stare at you but he must stay at a point beyond one of your shoulders. Now, we call this Tlonipa, which means deny me your eyes. We believe say, that when emotionally roused, 
an ordinary human being can inflict great damage on another human being by the f unseen fires that emanate from one's eyes. We believe that we, a, a, a Zulu warrior must never allow his dying enemy to look at him. For example, when a Zulu was killing an enemy, he used to cover that enemy's face with his shield to prevent the enemy looking upon him with his eyes and putting a curse upon him. It's interesting, people um, who've experienced uh, the Chittahuli, the reptilians, um, in relationship to the British royal family and others at various rituals have said that um, at the point of sacrifice, the point of death in the sacrifice, that these reptilians stare into the eyes of the person dying, which would kind of fit why those, those warriors were very concerned about that. Yes, sir. What are they doing then? We have got a ritual, sir, which covers many fields, a ritual which is called Ukutata Umoya, taking away the soul where when a king is dying and he is fighting to pass on his knowledge and his courage to his successor, he would demand that the successor should stare heavily into the dying king's eyes. And also, when a creature is being sacrificed in Africa, whether it's a human being or an animal, that creature must be stared at by the sacrificer so that its spiritual characteristics are drunk in by the one sacrificing it. Okay. I, I have seen many times on hunting expeditions in Kenya, Tanzania, and other parts of Africa, when a lion is just about to breathe its last, the hunter, one of the hunters, will stare into the lion's eyes until the lion's eyes start glazing in death. It is drinking in the soul. We believe sir, that the eyes are not just for seeing, that they are for taking as well. Now, on the hand uh, here is what looks like the symbol of the constellation of Orion. Um, what's the significance of that? Say, people throughout Africa believe that the original human beings either came from Orion or the gods for whom read the Chitauli and many other alien nasties actually come from that constellation. We call it the constellation of Umhambi, the one who travels very, very far away. And we call this constellation also the constellation of Matsieng, the giant who was sent by God to this earth to create uh, 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 the first human beings. Matsieng was accompanied by a male lion with a very black mane. And he was also accompanied by his dog. And he traveled throughout the world he first created the first race of human beings and he was, they were so stupid in appearance that he buried them alive in, the cave, in a cave and then he created the next race of human beings which was clever and we are the descendants of that race. Also on the um, hand is the, what we would call today the Star of David, which of course is not actually a Jewish symbol. It started being used uh, quite relatively recently uh, uh, in that 
sense, uh, uh, but it's actually a symbol that's been found all over the ancient world. What's the significance of that being on the hand? I say, there are several interpretations of this very powerful uh, 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 magical symbol. We say that there are actually two universes living side by side. A female universe, which is our universe, and a male universe. And to Sanusis, these two triangles, a triangle facing downwards represents the descending female principle and a triangle going upwards represents the rising male principle. It is a symbol of the unity of the feminine and the masculine. It is in fact the symbol, a very important symbol of duality. Is this the kind of um, shape of spacecraft, etc., or flying craft that um, the uh, beings from other planets were no, supposed sir. to have flown in or not? No. This, you see, sir, there are various shapes. There are spacecrafts which are shaped like boomerangs or bowls. Mm -hmm. These are very, very, very big. Then there are spacecraft which are shaped like pipes, like huge pipes roughly pointed at either end. And out of those huge pipes come these little things here. Yeah. They are carried inside these huge pipes. Gotcha. Yes. Sir. Now, <clears throat> we could talk about this fella. Um, yes, first sir. of all, um, the, the, the penis and all this stuff, did, that relates, uh, I would have thought, to the, the penis of Osiris uh, in Egyptian legend and, and the same recurring theme. Um, would that be uh, along the right lines? We say, say, that King Samahong, who is represented here, yeah. the lord of all the Chitauri, call them what you will, had his penis cut off by Prince Muari, an African hero, and he replaced it with a golden one. Originally, we are told, this thing was made of gold. And now each time when we recall the story of the great marriage between human women and Chitauri men, we unite. These creatures symbolically. And sometimes when the necklace is lying on the ground, we we make a bed out of animal skin for these two figures and then we lay them side by side and cover them with a, a small skin. So um, why um, are the depictions of the gods um, if they were reptilian why are they not constantly reptilian? Why are they symbolized in other forms? Because uh, it is very, very, very forbidden to portray a Chitawuli as it really is. Only in that large green head do we see a Chitawuli represented more or less as it is. So this was dictated by the Chitawuli from yes, the start, was it? Yes. All along? It was, you are not allowed to represent the sons of the python as they really are, then you are really in trouble. If you want to talk about the Chitauli, you must either play with shadows, you must place an image of a Chitauli against a light and project its shadow onto the wall. So, so you've got a fish, I know, um, um, on the necklace as well, and yes. fish, fish are scaled. Is this anything to do with the symbolic representation of the Chittahuli in, yes, in, a, in a way that they couldn't do it openly? Yes, sir. They also, 
there is a particular Chitaul who is called Wawane by our people. Wawane was one of the few good Chitaul because there are also some good people amongst them. Mm -hmm. And Wawane had a brother called Mpangu. According to one of the great stories, they erupted a terrible war on the Red World where human beings had originally been created. And this war was between men and women. Sir. Mama, yes. yes sir. And in this world, men and women nearly decimated each other. But they were rescued by the Earth Mother who sent a great Nganyamba, that is, a great dragon, to come out of the sky to take them into its stomach and to bring them down to, not to our earth, to a beautiful watery world near the, the star of the red dog, Injebomvu, which the white people call Sirius, the star of anger, they, human beings, were settled, but human beings started eating creatures which they found in the sea, which they thought were fishes, but which were really human beings. Human beings, we are told, started eating the Chitawuli who lived in the sea, according to one story. And the Chitawuli fought back against human beings they attacked them with tornadoes, they attacked them with, with tidal waves, and the human race was nearly wiped out. And then two brothers, two Chitauli youths, Mpangu and Wawan, took pity upon the human race. And they went into the sky and looked for a great egg and they hollowed out this egg, emptied its contents out, and brought the egg to that world and loaded the surviving human beings and brought them to our world here. We say sir, that Wawan gave us the power of kingship. He brought it out of the sky. And if you notice, in many parts of Africa, ancient kings used to wear a wooden helmet with golden horns. It was true in West Africa and it was true also in Southern Africa in the great Munumutapa Empire. The horns representing the, the Chitahuli. Yes, uh, the power of the Chitahuli. Because to a Chitahuli, horns are not just for goring other Chitahuli as oxen go each other. No, horns are a symbol of status. And through its horns, a Chitahuli is able to communicate with human beings far across the, the, the face of the earth. So the horns were like antennae then? Yes, they were instruments of projecting power. In fact, it is said by storytellers that King Samahongo punishes those Chitauli who show mercy to human beings by pointing at them so that both their horns fall off their heads. And the Chitauri is therefore unable to, to, to direct human affairs through his or her horns. It's also interesting that you know, the, the descriptions of the Chittahuli um, with the, the horns and the, sometimes the tail and stuff it's very, very close to how uh, Christians and uh, those sort of stories have depicted the devil. Yes, and one thing that interests me is this.
that depictions of the devil have, have subtly changed over the centuries. But there is a difference now. First, originally, the devil was depicted as a hook, hook-nosed creature, like a caricature of a North African moor. That was at the time when the Europeans were fighting the Moors as well as the Ara Arabs during the Crusades. Many depictions of the devil then show the devil as having a hooked nose. And then later, somewhere in the 19th century early, the devil was depicted as an African with a snub nose, thick lips, and very dark skin. But what amazes me is that now, more than ever before, the devil is represented as a chidawul. What, what concerns me, sir, is this, that these alien creatures, are now about to reveal themselves and they are making us aware of how they look like if you look for example at at uh, bioscope films which were made in the 1950s the 30s and and so on depictions of space aliens of that time are ridiculous very lovable, but not anymore, sir. Today, we are having films that depict the grey aliens exactly as they really are, and the Chitauli exactly as they really are. My question is why? Are we being prepared for a major event? And let me share this with you. The group of American people who came to visit me a week or so ago and who left a rather unveiled threat about me shutting up or else my wife will die, who warned me about a certain creature called Eleazar or Melchizedek, that this creature is watching me, these people say, said this, that on Lake Titicaca there is a hidden beam of light coming from the sky onto the surface of that South American lake, and that on the 9th of September, 1999, something very interesting is going to happen at Titicac. Now, I'm interested to know what this is. Well, I know from my own travels to that area that um, there are endless sightings of uh, craft and, and beings in that area. I've been there twice myself. And I, I, I do think, from again, from my own research, Credo, that um, we are being prepared for these... <coughs> Uh, beings to openly um, be seen. And being prepared this way, sir, we, when we do see the, the nasties, we are not going to react to them with the fear that we would otherwise have reacted. Mm -hmm. Because now what, what game is someone playing? I think, sir, that they are playing the game that whoever they are, that we should accept these beings and welcome them with open arms mm -hmm. and make them our masters? Uh, yet again. You see, sir, there has been a steady build-up in books, in children's comics, and in other things of the fact that we must accept these creatures. It started with the with the film E.T., where a cute little 
alien creature got lost on earth and fought hard to be accepted by human beings. I think the same thing is on the cards here. The question is why? The one other thing I would just like to raise before we move into the, the, the bloodlines and their yes. connection to the Illuminati is one thing that keeps coming up in, in my work is that some of these um, Chittahuli, these reptilians, um, at a high level of their hierarchy are actually white. Have you come across that? Yes. They are not white like white people. If you take, if you take white cardboard, and you soak it in dirty water. That is the color you will get. That is the color of the cheetah wool. And wait, sir, let us think carefully about this. According to African storytellers, the cheetah wool have got cold blood. They feel cold very quickly. And where they dwell under the earth, where the great sun god banished them. They dwell there surrounded by great fires because their blood is cold. They freeze eternally. And so if you come across them in, cave, in their caves, there are many, many cooking fires lit there. That's interesting with the symbolism of the devil being in the fires of hell. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And there is another thing. The, the, the Chitauli, they, their eyes, terrible as they are, are so efficient that if a Chitauli appears suddenly, into the hot African sunlight, two things happen to him. His skin dries and blisters, and he goes totally blind. In fact, there have been a strange race of aliens which have been seen in Africa, even by white people, which I think are actually Chitauli. When you that you run and the thing chases you. It stops immediately when a car's headlights hit it and it becomes blind. Another thing, sir, we are told amongst our people that a Sangoma must always have a bogo. This is a sharpened wooden stick which he or she must carry at night. We are told that a sharpened stick is the only weapon by which you can kill a chitaut. Well, of, of course, again and again as you speak, uh, what comes to mind is the story of Dracula. Count Dracula, the stake in the heart, the blood drinker, the, the blood drinking, uh, which is precisely uh, what this uh, Chittahuli and their crossbreeds seem to be into. But uh, it is not just any wood that you must use against a Chittahuli. We believe that Rhodesian teak, a wood which has got a strange bitter taste, is the one type of wood that is poisonous to the Chittahuli. And down there, you see a long stick that I am carving in preparation for the year 2000. I might not be alive to see the year 2012, but this stick, which I've been working upon for the last five years, is going to be the one stick which my successor will carry, and it will end in a sharp point. This this wood, rotation tick, is the wood that we say can actually kill a chitauli. And where the chitauli are found, you find 
Rhodesian teak or any other teak trees either being felled in large quantities or being pushed over by elephants. May I point out to you, sir, that many of the trees that are being destroyed in the Amazon jungle and in the southeast up, east, southeastern Asian jungles as well as in the African jungles are teak. Mm -hmm. The one wood that the cheetah would fear. And while on the subject of wood, the only mask that can protect you against a chitaul is a mask made of teak. And in some of the flea markets around Johannesburg, I'm seeing more and more masks carved in Mozambique and in Zimbabwe representing a chitaul. The eyes are huge, round, with slits through which a person can see and the lips are non-existent, and so is the nose. I've seen hundreds of such masks being sold by curious sellers in the streets. One of the other things that comes up in terms of the way they look is, is the domed head. Now, I was in yes. Egypt um, recently and uh, saw uh, depictions of Nefertiti and uh, the Akhenaten um, family, and they had big domed heads. Um, is this uh, a connection? Yes. Yes, sir. You see, <coughs> we human beings tend to imitate those creatures that we call gods. It's going on even now. When African women saw white people, they named them Abelu which literally means the gods. And today, in America and in Africa, black women and some black men are going out of their way to give themselves hair, which is European and not African in character. Now, this thing, say, was, was, it dates back thousands of years. First of all, the, the one race of the Chitauri, the ones that are called Nomo or Nomo in, by the Dogoni people, are depicted say, as having beard-like growths of the same type that look like the beards of Egyptian pharaohs. Mm. They are shown having, it is said so that when a Chitauri gets very old, after tens of thousands of years, he, he or she develops a bone-like growth under the chin which twists around like the horn of that kind of fish-like creature I saw in Europe in a picture called a narwhal. And this thing curls up this way. Now, Egyptian pharaohs used to wear beards like that. Mm -hmm. And some African kings wore beards like that, real beards or even false beards made out of ivory or out of the tusk of a white hog. And the, there, is a, there was a time definitely in history say, when African kings as well as Egyptian pharaohs went out of their way to imitate the appearance of the Chitaur. Queens like Nefertiti had their fa faces misrepresented by the court painters. They looked exactly like the Chitauli as, they, as near as possible. The high cheekbones, the drooping chin, the unusually large head. African Sangomas, African Inyangas, 
ancient Egyptian pharaohs, all of them used to wear headdresses that made their heads look much larger than they actually were. If you look say, at the crown, certain crowns worn by Egyptian kings, the whole head, the crown, is intended to be an extension of the pharaoh's head to give the pharaoh an appearance of above average uh, intelligence. In Africa, we had kings who favored headdresses made out of the scrotums of elephants or, or rhinoceroses or even buffaloes. A scrotum which was dried and made bulbous and worn on the head by the king to make his head look larger than it was. And lastly, in ancient Greece, at the time when Greece reached the, high, the great heights in its culture and civilization, the great ruler Pericles used to wear a special soldier's helmet with a bulbous skull a helmet which made his head look much bigger than it really was. Do and they still do that today? Do they, do, are there still African traditions that do that Yes, today? yes, yes, very much so. And in America, some Native American shamans used to wear a special head made out of this, the head and the horns of a buffalo, which also made the... the, the the man's head look bigger than it is. Say, popes, the pope in Rome, wears a head which is intended to show him as having a brain bigger than average. That crown which has got one, three crowns, one on top of the other one. And now, Bishops, especially in the Greek Orthodox Church, they wear crowns like that. And the Tsar of Russia, one of the Tsars, wore a bulbous crown which was in two sections, which made his head bigger than it really was. And in Persia, in Iran, some Ayatollahs wear a turban which, whose effect is to make the man's head look bigger than it is, so does a Sikh. And so, for that matter, do the ancient priests of Israel, they also wore an onion-shaped uh, headdress, whose, whose impression was to give him a far and above size head. Don't there, aren't there also um, traditions in which they um, manipulate children's heads as they're growing to so yeah. that they become more yeah. like Yeah. During my troubles, troubles in Africa, say, I came across an amazing people whom you must visit. They are called the Mangbetu people and they live near Lake Rudolph in Central Africa. They are a beautiful, aristocratic people. And what they don't know about the universe is just not worth knowing. The Mangbetu people believe that an elongated skull with a flattened forehead pleases the gods. They, they, they flatten the skulls of their children, causing constant headaches to the child, even when the child has grown into adulthood. And I asked a, a beautiful Mangbetu woman, Madam, why do you torture your children this way? The woman, the wife of a senior chief, said to me, look, the gods want us to be like this.
story that you're telling, Credo, from the African perspective, is it in effect the same story as told in the um, tens of thousands of uh, clay tablets uh, found in what we now call Iraq, who become known as the Sumerian tablets, that talk about a race of gods called the Anunnaki, who um, came in and brought knowledge, ruled the people, and interbred with them? Yes. Do you say, therefore, that the Anunnaki in those uh, stories that have increasingly, of course, been translated in a number of books, yes. they were reptilian, you say? Say, all I do know is this, that here in South Africa, amongst the Khoza people, amongst the Zulu people, there are beings who are very revered even now, and they are called Amanuna or Amanono. Amanono is Zulu, Amanona is Kosa. Now these beings are godlike beings, we are told. They can change their faces. They can change their appearance. They can shape Yes, sir. They are shape shifters. A manuna, a man now if if a Khoza man has married a very beautiful wife, a wife whose face seems to change every day, he teases that wife by calling her his Inuna, Linunalam. In other words, a shape shifter. Say, it is said that the, the people who are closest to the hearts of the Manuna gods are women. And why? Because the women give to the Manuna the power of, they worship the Manuna, the hero worship them which explains why Nefertiti wanted herself to look like one of them, and her children too. She was actually hero-worshipping these creatures. And the, 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 how you say, women say, are copycats, and I'm not being sexist when I say this, women will copycat any being that they think is supreme. In Egypt also, um, you have the, the python-like headdresses, which are, are pretty obvious when you look at them, that the pharaohs were um, connected with. Yes, sir. And the reptile has played an unusually strange uh, part in the culture of all African tribes. For example, it is my suspicion say, that we black people of Southern Africa are going to be deprived of our nationhood in the very near future and that we are going to be ruled by people of Uganda. But wait, what is the real meaning of the word Baganda, Baganda, and what is the creature that you see depicted in, on the walls of houses and on the roofs of houses of some of the greatest empires in Africa? It is the python. There was a golden python which was used as a decoration on the roof of the, of the house in which the king of Benin, the Oba, lived. Zulu people revere the Mamba, a very terrible snake. Zulu people revere other snakes as well. And in Venda, in the northern Transvaal, the, the Venda people regard the snake as well as the crocodile as sacred. 
and they, even today, their girls dance at initiation, a, a, a long, rather sinuous dance representing the movements of a python. And they call that dance the Domba dance. And Domba is the ancient name for a female python. Well, wherever you look, all over the world, whether it's the Maya of Central America, you look at South America, Africa, anywhere, the, the symbolism of the snake, the crocodile, the representation of the reptilian is there. You go into Europe, then the Illuminati created uh, cathedrals like Notre Dame in Paris. You've got the stately homes of the aristocracy, etc., uh, with the gargoyles, the reptilian figures. It's been in our face, but we just somehow have had a blind spot to see it. We human beings have idolized the reptile since the very supposed birth of our history. Go even further, say, much further. What was the creature which was honored by the ancient Greeks in their Delphic oracle? The python. What is the creature that stands next to the figures of the goddess Athena? The python. No matter where you look, go to China, where I once went. Who are the principal characters who brought wisdom to, to humankind? Creatures, part snake and part human being, one of whom I remember correctly was called Nu, a, a word which occurs also in Africa, and her brother was Kua, Kua, and sometimes it's turned into one creature, Nukwa, she. Every way we, we human beings has, have sacrificed our dignity as a species and attributed great intellect and great glory to reptiles, tortoises, turtles, s lizards, snakes. Why? And even now, say, our fascination with the reptile and the amphibian has not stopped. In fact, it's growing. The popularity of all those dinosaurs in cartoon as well as in serious form, it makes me uneasy. If we could just pick up this line of, of bloodlines, which the Sumerian tablets talk about, which you talk about, the interbreeding of humanity and the, how the accounts explain that these crossbreeds were put into the positions of royal ruling power, almost as like demigods, um, middlemen between the gods, the Chittahuli, the reptiles, and the people. Um, those bloodlines, in my own research, um, became the European royal families and aristocracy, and today are the ruling banking, business, and political and royal lines of the world. Um, and the genealogy supports this increasingly. Is there a tradition also that the royal lines of Africa go back to the same source? Please, you don't have to believe me. Go to Rwanda and there talk to the people there. They will tell you that they, the founding ancestors of their dynasties, the first kings who came from the sky and they were called Imanugela, the ascending ones. Say, many, many, many African tribes believe that when the gods came down from the sky, they found human beings very, very stupid. And the human beings could not come before the gods in order to be taught. So what the gods did, and this is a story that you also find amongst the Dogoni people in West Africa. Because the, the, the human beings were afraid of approaching 
the, these reptile gods. The reptile gods cold-bloodedly slaughtered one of their number and shed out its flesh with a specially gathered crowd of human beings. And these human beings then became the ancestors of our first great kings. Now say, African kings jealously guarded their blood. If the royal lines of Africa claim descendants for the same source, basically, have those lines interbred as obsessively as the European aristocracy and royal family and not bred outside of those lines? Yes, sir. Royalty had to marry royalty. That was one of the strictest laws in ancient times. Which is obviously where we get the, the term the divine right of kings from. It's not actually God, it's actually the gods. Yes, sir, yes, yes. Royalty intermarried with royalty. You, could, you were not allowed to take a commoner as your senior wife. If you were a king, you could take commoners after your senior wife. Yeah. Once the, geni the genetics has been achieved. Yes. Now, another thing, it is like the Sangomas. Very, very strictly speaking, a Sangoma who was sometimes viewed as a king or a queen, was not allowed to marry outside her caste or his caste. Sangoma had to marry Sangoma, otherwise the non-Sangoma blood would pollute the god blood inside the Sangoma. The, um lady that I've quoted in my books, uh, Kathy O'Brien, who wrote her own book, Transformation of America, about being a mind-controlled slave of the American elite, um, she talks in there about seeing George Bush um, as president and vice president shapeshift into a reptile. And, and so many other people have told me this story of world leaders today uh, changing into reptiles in front of their eyes and then changing back again. And Miguel de la Madrid, the president of Mexico at the time of George Bush, said to Kathy O'Brien, as she quotes in her book, that an, a reptilian extraterrestrial race interbred with the ancient Central American people because they needed to create bloodlines through which they could operate. Yes. And he said that these bloodlines were, in effect, today's world leaders. Does it fit with your knowledge, Credo, that the royal lines of the Chittahuli reptilian human interbreeding that become the demigods and the royal families, etc., that they have gone on in Africa as well as the rest of the world to become the ruling lines and the ruling people of these countries? Yes, many of them have. In fact, some of Africa's most terrible warmongers, men who have drenched large areas of Africa in unnecessary blood and suffering, are directly descended from some of our greatest emperors of 600, 500, or even a thousand years ago. Just as the American presidents are. Say, I would like to tell you about a man called Jonas Savimbi. Jonas Savimbi is a descendant of some of the greatest Angola kings. In fact, the entire land called Angola was a breeding place of kingship in Africa. The, the word Ngola, Ngola, means a king, and Angola means land of many kings. 
I must say, the way that the evidence that I'm uncovering uh, is going, and it's going there very fast, it, and it syncs so much with what you're saying, is that a race from the stars, a reptilian race, interbred with humanity, they created um, crossbreed bloodlines, which became the middlemen, the demigods, the royal kings and lines and uh, ruling power in the ancient uh, world. And through interbreeding has become the presidents, the uh, ruling uh, people in, at the top of the power structures of banking, of politics, of the military, um, of all areas of our lives, of, of, uh, of business, all of it. Um, is that the way that you have seen it yourself? Yes, sir. You know, Mr. Ike, I wish for one moment I could, co I could contradict you. But for the last 40 years, I have observed an extremely disconcerting phenomenon in South Africa and in other parts of Africa as well. And this is the phenomenon. You find a rising black leader, a real leader amongst men, a ferocious activist for the rights of his people. This man starts something, whether it's a revolution or whatever, he starts it. And you look at his ancestry, because in Africa we, we look very closely at a man's ancestry. And you find that this man is nothing. Although he is doing such great deeds, he is actually a, a, a descendant of very peasant people. Ow. And you are worried. And all of a sudden, this black man will come to a sudden violent end, and a person who is totally new, will take his place. And when you look at the ancestors of these people, this man, you find that he, or even she, is a person of very, very ancient royal, African royalty. Now, let me show you. There was this war in Rhodesia and many people got killed there. And there was a very fierce and dedicated general. His name was Tongo Gara. And Tongo Gara fought in Rhodesia. And just when victory was won, Tongo Gara was killed in a terrific explosion. Somebody put a bomb thing in his car and killed him very badly. But wait, Tongo Gara had been a descendant of a blacksmith. His surname, Tongo Gara, means powerful hammer. Now, who replaced Tongo Gar? A man called Robert Mugabe. Now you can't get more royal than that. Mugabe is descended from ancient Mashona kings, and what is more, he knows it. Always a leader is removed, and a and when the power really comes, a new leader descended from some faraway monarch or tribal chieftain two centuries or three centuries ago comes on the scene. Again and again there seems to be this particular force which elevates its descendants over ordinary human beings. I can give you hundreds of cases of this. Now, say, talk about a tradition of shape shifting. 
African kings, even now, and even ordinary tribal chieftains, especially in times of crisis, often spread the story through the land that they are able to change shape at will. There was a time when the South African government created the various Bantu homelands. And these homelands were ruled by those tribal chiefs who were agreeable to the apartheid system. Now, some of these chiefs were very unpopular with the people on the ground. And so, to build a charisma around themselves, these chiefs used to tell people that they are capable of changing shape at will. It was spoken about a certain African chief in the Transkai, who became one of the first rulers of one of several black homelands there, that one day his enemies were, were looking for him to assassinate him, and when they broke into his house, they found a huge lion sitting on the, on the floor. And this lion growled at them. And because of that story, because even today, word of mouth is a very powerful media of communication in black communities, all enemies of that particular chief left him well alone because they feared his shape-changing cha powers. The final question on this particular video, um, Credo, because we've got a lot more to say on others. Um, why is it that if the Chittahuli are all around us, which I certainly feel they are, um, and they're operating certain bloodlines, now some people see them shape-shift. That's absolutely without doubt. I mean, so many people I've met all over the world have seen it. Um, into reptiles and then back again, the George Bushes, the Henry Kissingers, uh, these key people. Um, why don't most people see it? First of all, sir, I have said to you, Mr. Ike, that we human beings have got a blind spot in our brains. And this is what the Chitauli and other alien nasty boys are exploiting. Look, sir, if we are a crowd and we are standing on a city street, we will see a man suddenly grow an extra arm. And many, many of us will see that, but will refuse to accept what they have seen. I have seen, sir, people going through severe trauma, in train accidents, in car accidents, but they refuse to accept what they went through. I have seen women who have been raped several times, ferociously refusing to admit what, when, the, 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 what they underwent. I've seen it many times. And these alien creatures say, know our weakness. They know that very often we human beings tend to censor what we see. If, if you are an educated professor and you see a spook, your educated mind will refuse to accept what it has seen. You will reject it and throw it to the back banner of your brain and it will stay there. Hundreds of us see very strange things every day, but we refuse to accept what we see. Say, one of the things that a trainee Sangoma has got to, to learn, it is the ability to see. If I am standing here and looking at that bush over there, and I see something odd there. I must know what I've seen. But wait, sir. 
there is something else, something very, 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 very important, which I and many other thinkers in Africa have found. Mr. Ike, whenever you talk about such things, people call you paranoid. Mm -hmm. But no, you are really more sane than they really are. Say, there are certain vaccination things that are done to our children which rob them of the ability of seeing spiritual entities. Believe me, I can prove this. In Zululand, we were sometimes called before the chief, before our chiefs, our Ingos, and we were told that there is a great smallpox coming to the land and that all children must be vaccinated. Do you know that my mother's father, my grandfather, used to dodge that? He said that the white man's job, the white man's vaccination, makes you blind. And if you are to look after my cattle, you must not go to the trading store to get your vaccination. But wait, the school inspectors used to come into the land and check each child for signs of vaccination or lack of it. Now, do you know what we used to do, Mr. David Dyke? Our grandmothers used to give us great pain in order to save our spiritual eyes. They used to heat grains of maize, and then they would heat this grain of maize, and using two pieces, a piece of wood as tweezers, place it firmly against the skin of the child. So when the school inspector came, he saw these blisters and assumed that the child had been vaccinated, but in fact it had not. And this was done to us many, many times. And I noticed that school children in mission schools who had been vaccinated for smallpox or for measles could not see spiritual entities at all. A, 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 a Ndondo, that is a flying saucer, a spuputek, would fly through the sky at great speed and be seen by many men and women. But the child who had been vaccinated would see nothing. And I noticed this hundreds of times. Well, what you've just said about the vaccines and their effect and shutting us down spiritually and multidimensionally uh, is fantastic given that um, no matter what your background, creed, culture, parents on every inch of the planet almost are being pressurized to have their children vaccinated more and more and more. And to summarize what you've been saying, um, and indeed it's so much in line with what I've come to the conclusion about as well, um, an extraterrestrial race, reptilian race, disconnected us from our true magnificent senses um, in a long, long ancient world. They've been manipulating us ever since, and the more the time has passed, the less we've realized this is going on. And now we're at a point where we are in a prison without bars, a massive prison, um, and we don't even know we're in prison. We don't even know the jailers are. Indeed, when the jailers are exposed, people just laugh and ridicule and all that stuff. So we're in a, an unbelievable situation. And we're, it, we're, we're in a jail we deny we're in. And there are jailers we deny exist. And we call it freedom. Yes, sir. Yes. You know, Mr. David, the reason, one of the reasons why I've joined forces with you is because I have serious reason to believe, and I will repeat these words until somebody shuts my mouth in death. 
I have serious reason to believe that on this planet things are coming to a head and our invisible jailers are going to fight tooth and nail to prevent this. Say, our people say that the blackest night often heralds the brightest dawn. The human being, captive as he is, slave as it is, is trying to fight back, say. And this is where the crunch is going to come. I believe that we are not far away from the bloodiest crunch in the world. And I will tell you, my visions tell me that we are going to be struck with the most terrible sword of all, the sword of money. Say. Something is going to be done to money which will bring us all to the level of beggars. And do you know why, sir? Let me tell you. I used to work for big game hunters in Kenya. And one of them was an Italian gentleman. This Italian gentleman was such a, a powerful hunter, a white hunter. He used to shoot two bull elephants a day in Kenya, and he used to celebrate the shooting with a huge bottle, he called it a, ma a magnum, of wine. I remember him pouring some of the wine onto the heads of the dead elephants. And then, one day we went with this man to the land now called Rwanda which used to be called Rwanda Urundi. We went up the mountain and there, accompanied by pygmies, he shot a gorilla, a huge ngangi with silver fur all along its back. And the great beast died so bravely that this Italian hunter started weeping like a woman. He fired us told us that the job is finished and he never hunted again. Say, what I'm trying to tell you is this, that something inside us human beings is beginning to fight back against the Chitauri. Something inside us human beings is beginning to say no. And the Chitauri are going to drag us all right into hell itself in order to, re to restore their power over us. Let me show you. Who would have thought in the 1950s during the time of the Cold War when everybody was expecting a bloody Third World War between Stalinist Russia and the Western nations, when British, American, and even Russian nuclear bombs were exploding all over the place. Who would have thought that a few decades after that, there would come a time when a group of young men and women, the people of Greenpeace, would sail their ship the Greenpeace warrior, into a nuclear zone to prevent the French from testing one more atomic bomb. This tells us uh, that something inside the human soul is fighting back. Forty years ago, it was once a very glamorous thing to, to kill animals. Today, a big game hunter like my Italian friend would never dare show himself in some hotels. He would be spat at and he would be beaten up by people because the hero of yesterday, the Buana Banduki, the gun Buana of 40 years ago, is today a murderer. Now, things are coming to a crunch. 
40 years ago, nobody cared a damn about the environment. People did not even know that there existed such a thing as an environment or a food chain. Today, there are people who would rather lose their lives than not save a buck which is drowning in a river. A God is being born inside us, all of us, but herein lies the danger. We must be aware of the Chitaur. They are a real entities. They leave scars on human bodies. They kill people. They are murdering South Africa even as we are talking now. Every word you and I are speaking now is spoken too late, Mr. David Icke. AIDS is rampaging through our communities. And I have found a new disease in Botswana, which nobody is talking about even. It is 20 times more vicious than AIDS. It is called Ebola. Oh my God. And we, we must please be aware. Let nobody laugh when we talk about conspiracy theories. But there is one thing, sir, that I beg that you and others like you should discard una momento, as they say in South America. Stop calling the conspiracy a theory, say. Theories do not kill people, Mr. David Ike. Theories do not murder innocent children. Theories do not put multiple murderers of Kabila's stripe into power in countries. Absolutely. Theories are just ideas floating in the air. This, the conspiracy is real. It is there and it kills. The staggeringly intelligent, the staggeringly wise and the staggeringly knowledgeable Kredo Mutwa. And his knowledge the world needs to know. Not only is Kredo a man who has gathered this enormous knowledge together, he's a man with the courage and the foresight and the wisdom to know that the world needs to hear this, even though most of the world, particularly those who run the world, don't want anyone to hear this. But if we're going to be free, and we are, then we need to know all there is to know, and not just that which the few want us to think is the world, when a very different world is unfolding all around us every day. In the next video, we're going to be taking the story on with Credo, and showing how these reptilian bloodlines and this Chittahuli, this reptilian group, expanded their power across the world, took over Africa and other great continents, and today are the ruling elite that controls planet Earth. And by knowing that, and by knowing how it's done and how it works, we can take control and power back into our lives from those who have controlled us and this planet for thousands of years. It's a great time to be alive from Africa for now. Thank you and thanks for listening to a remarkable man. Hello and welcome for a second time to Africa, the countryside of South Africa, just outside Johannesburg, for the second in our series with Credo Mutwa, the Zulu Sanusi, or shaman, as many people around the world would call him, the keeper of the history, the true history of Africa and the Zulu people, and the official storyteller, in other words, the carrier of the knowledge and the symbolic stories of the Zulu nation. 
He is without any question in my mind whatsoever the most remarkable, astonishing man it's been my honor to meet. And to share his incredible knowledge has been a time I personally will never forget. In the first of these videos, we discussed with Credo uh, the story of the Chittahuli, the reptilian extraterrestrial race from another world that came to the earth in the far ancient world that brought advanced knowledge which built many of the according to conventional history unexplainable magnificent structures um, all across the world thousands and thousands of years old and also interbred with humanity creating hybrid crossbreed bloodlines these bloodlines as my own research uh, for books like The Biggest Secret and Credo's immense knowledge of the African history uh, which he's gathered in his nearly 80 years of traveling this vast and amazing continent. Both correlate the same story remarkably that this Chittahuli, this reptilian race interbred with humanity and the bloodlines became the almost demigods, the royal ruling lines of the ancient world, particularly in the ancient Near and Middle East, which were the middlemen, if you like, between the extraterrestrial gods to which people were literally sacrificed and the people in general. And as the genealogical research is showing, these crossbreed bloodlines, the Nephilim, as the Old Testament of the Bible calls them, the result of the interbreeding between the sons of God, as the Bible calls them, the sons of the gods in the true translation, and earth women. The marriage, the uh, bringing together of the sons of God and the daughters of men. This Nephilim crossbreed race, as the genealogy has shown, came out of that area and into Europe to become the aristocracy and the royal families of Europe and then through the British Empire became uh, the ruling bloodlines of most of the world. In fact, today, almost all of the world. Like the 42 presidents out of the hundreds of millions of people who have been Americans since the Declaration of Independence in 1776, 42 have become president. They're all related. What? And they go back to these ruling aristocratic families, which eventually go back to the crossbreed uh, inter- relationship into course between the Chittahuli, the Anunnaki as some accounts call them, and human beings. And it's the British Empire that we're going to talk about now in its relationship to taking over the planet in a way that today is now global. The British Empire um, became the British Empire because this network of bloodlines which had become known as the Illuminati centered itself in London at operational level uh, particularly after the arrival from Holland of William of Orange who became King of England in 1689 and from that time um, he signed the charter that created the Bank of England and the banking system as we know it started to expand and emerge but from that time the British Empire and the other European empires came into being and they took the planet over now one immensely important area that they completely controlled and raped was the fantastic continent of Africa. And to look at how Africa was taken over by this Illuminati, Chittahuli, reptilian crossbreeds, and uh, indeed the reptilian race itself that's behind it all, is to see how the world has been taken over, the methods used, the way it was done, the manipulations. And what we're going to talk to uh, Credo about now, among many other things, is the way that the continent of Africa was hijacked by the Illuminati. And I asked him first to tell me the story of how this great continent was taken over. So, there are mysteries in this world that we as thinking human beings must look into and one of these mysteries is this 
there is overwhelming evidence of the fact that before Africa was actually colonized by the white people from Europe, it was first prepared by strange people for this colonization. When the first Portuguese ships started sailing around the Cape of Good Hope, strange beings appeared amongst our people, strange human-like creatures, usually creatures of great height, abnormally tall, human-like beings, some of them with only one foot, appeared amongst our people and they started doing things there which, which made it easier for the colonialists to invade us and to conquer us. What were they like in terms of their color and skin, Crota? Say, we do not know, but there are those who described them as very, very white, chalk white in appearance. <coughs> this went on for so often that it became traditional to our people to represent these beings with white chalk. You found masks amongst our, our mask makers which were smeared entirely in white chalk to represent these creatures. These creatures were usually about eight feet tall very, very slender, and they used to wear robes made of the, the tanned hides of certain type of antelope, usually the, the intensely black sable antelope. What, what name did the uh, people give to them? We gave them the, 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 the name Izilo Zengubo the beasts of the terrible blanket. These creatures were dressed exactly like Christian monks, with hoods and long robes. In fact, I will draw you a likeness of one of them as it is shown in a rock painting. Now, these creatures used to live in holes in the ground or in, in, in uh, 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 underground uh, uh, in underground caverns or in, in, in gullies over which a roof of logs and, and vegetation as well as swords was placed. And it may be of interest to you, sir, that Portuguese explorers and Portuguese seamen used to see these one-legged creatures hopping about and sometimes disappearing into the ground as if by magic. And these creatures were called by the Portuguese sailors monopods. They wore a long robe that reached down to their ankles and they appeared as they moved through the bush as if they only had one leg. Monopods were seen in Africa and they were also seen in America before America was colonized by the white people. Among the Native Americans? Yes, sir. The, one of the 
<coughs> one of the things that amazed me is that the story of America and the story of Africa was the same. It is said say, that these monopoles introduced certain knowledge to our people. They actually prepared our people mentally for what was to come. For example, these monopoles, these uh, beasts of the terrible blanket, used to wear a cross-like ornament on their chests as a charm, a cross made of either gold or silver. Doesn't it amaze you that when the Native Americans saw the cross painted on the on the sails of Christopher Columbus's ships, they recognized it as a sacred object. Let me tell you, sir, exactly the same happened in South Africa, where our people were made familiar with the cross long before the white man set foot in Africa. And when our people saw this cross, this time brought by missionaries, they recognized it as a sacred object. In other ways, now, I don't know how to put this there, but can you put it for me? Our people were prepared long beforehand to, to recognize certain Christian symbol and Judaic symbols and when they saw them in the hands of the colonists later they saw them for what they were. This is one of the reasons why Mr. Ike Africans accepted and protected Christian missionaries even while fighting a life and death struggle against white colonialism. How is it that a man would accept the religion of an invader while at the same time fighting a life and death battle against the encroachments that this invader was making into his native land? This happened in America. And this happened in Africa, and the, 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 the sources of this uh, 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 acceptance were the same. I, I wish I could put this in much better English than I'm, use, I'm using now, because I feel it is important. I, th I think you, you, you're putting it um, very clearly that it seems that this Chittahuli um, were... Uh, going around the world, preparing for the uh, occupation from the Illuminati Center in London and Europe of these various areas like Native America and Africa. Yes, sir. The, the, the story, you see, a great fraud is being committed in educational circles in that the educationists in their ivory towers force our young people to look at the colonization of Africa and America as if they were two separate uh, 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 in incidents. But certain factors in this colonization were the same in Africa and the same in America and they achieved exactly the same results. This is why I always argue that the conspiracy, the international conspiracy, began long, long before colonial, colonial times in Africa and in the Americas. <coughs> and the results were the same. 
look at this. Here is the great Zulu king, Shaka. Shaka is a warrior second to none. Shaka is also a prophet second to none. Shaka welcomes white people <coughs> to his empire of Natal. Shaka allows missionaries to operate freely through his country. And when Shaka dies, before Shaka died, he warned his half-brother, Dinga, that he must, under no circumstances, attack the white people. And that he must allow missionaries to operate freely amongst the Zulu people. In fact, during the reign of King Dinga and Shaka's half-brother, two missionaries, Reverend Halstead and Reverend Owen, had a mission station within sight of King Dingan's great village. But wait, sir, let me point out one thing. These missionaries were converting our people to Christianity and they often went out of their way to criticize and undermine the king's authority in the eyes of their converts. In other words, we have an amazing phenomena here where a great king is being undermined by the very people he has allowed to preach freely in, in his country. Why? Not a single South African scholar has ever asked himself why. Why, <coughs> why were our people so seemingly stupid as to allow a foreign religion into their country. Now, let me show you, sir, two horrendous tragedies. When the Belgians colonized the Congo, which is today the Democratic Republic of the Congo, King Leopold declared that the Congo was to be his personal property. And King Leopold and his men tortured and murdered several million black Congolese people in an act of genocide equal only to what the Nazis were later to do to the Jews. But under savage ill-treatment, under savage torture and humiliation, the Congolese, virtual slaves in their country, still respected Christian missionaries and followed them and gained hope from them. And in 1907, this time in the country today known as Namibia, the Germans embarked on a policy of genocide against the warrior people known as the Hereros. They murdered so many Hereros. They tortured and slaughtered so many men and women of that, of that nation, nation that for the, until as recently as the 1940s, Herero women were still so traumatized by what had happened that they were not producing any young at all. But in spite of the hideous genocide committed by General Van Trotha, in spite of the multiple murders, the Herero people clung to the Christian faith. 
Why? Exactly why? Our, I now come to my people, the Zulus. When King Dingan murdered the four tracker leader, Peter Thief, the act was watched by Reverend Owen and Reverend Halstead from their mission station, which was built on a hill overlooking King Dingan's great uh, village. Halstead and Owen, unharmed by Dingan, decided to flee from the place after them. And Dingan was deeply sorrowed that his favorite preachers had decided to leave him. And King Taitwayo, the warrior king who won the Battle of Isandwane in 1875 or thereabouts, never harmed missionaries. And a king who followed Tejuayo, King Dinizu, who was brutally tortured by the English, had a great friend in reverend, in Bishop Colenso, a Christian bishop, and his daughters, one of whom was called Mary. Although he had suffered so much at the hands of the British authorities, King Dinizulu never abandoned his white Christian friends. They comforted him and he depended desperately upon them and their Bible in his darkest hours. Would the same basic story, Credo, be true of how the British, um, or the Illuminati based in Britain, um, took over Australia too? Yes, I have found exactly the same stories. The Aborigines, like Africans, were deliberately softened up long before they, they were colonized by the white people. There were men, mysterious men, who often posed as gods, who, who undermined the will of the aborigines to resist the encroachment of the colonialists. It's also interesting that Captain Cook, who is the guy who's supposed to have, quote, discovered um, Australia, New Zealand, that area of the world, yes. was actually sponsored and funded and in, in fact controlled by the Royal Society which was a Freemasonic and is a Freemasonic a science operation based in London. Yes, sir. Let, let me show you another interesting thing. There is a man I have been investigating in vain for over 40 years now. A man who committed acts of hideous genocide upon our people here in South Africa. A man of whom historians are so fond that he is practically a white cow whom you may not dare to point a finger at. If you see me sitting in front of you, a man who was demo demonized over 30 years ago by the South African news media, it was because I asked questions about this white man, Sir George Gray. Who was Sir George Gray? What was he? Was he a Freemason? Was he an Illuminati? How is it that this Sir George Gray, who is the, the actual founder of the most oppressive laws that British colonialism ever settled our people with. Apartheid was laid down by Sir George Grey. The carrying of identity papers was laid down by Sir George Grey 
in the, nine, in the 1850s, in the last century. And Sir George Grey dealt our kings a mortal blow. But let me first tell you, this man was sent from London to quell a Maori rebellion in New Zealand which had defeated the efforts of military men. The Maori were unstoppable. Their rebellion was blazing like a bushfire through New Zealand. But when George Grey was sent to New Zealand, he managed to quell this rebellion with very, very little loss of life. What did George Gray do? I have never been able to find a book which tells me exactly what did George Gray do in New Zealand in order to pacify the Maoris who had beaten the efforts of the, sol the British soldiers. Because that same George Gray was brought from New Zealand to South Africa in order to quell a great rebellion by the Khoza people. And George Gray used outright trickery in order to force the Khoza people to actually destroy themselves. George Gray deliberately and cold-bloodedly tricked the Khoza people into slaughtering their own cattle, burning their own crops. It is one of the saddest stories of our country's blood-drenched history. And almost overnight, George Gray reduced the Khoza people of the Eastern Cape into a nation of dying skeletal starvelings. Because after, after George Gray had manipulated the causes with a raw trickery into destroying their crops, destroying their cattle, he practically had them on the plate. Hunger, raw hunger and starvation achieved what military might had failed to, to achieve after many, many embattled decades. George Gray was a psychologist par excellence. George Gray was a trickster who knew the native races and he knew how to exploit their beliefs to, their, to bring about their own destruction. Let me show you what Gray did. One day, when great tension was boiling up in the Cape, and when the, the colonialists were threatened by yet another border war between themselves and the, and the Khoza people, a number of women were, at, a number of Khoza women, amongst them a Sangoma, a priest, priestess diviner called Nongaus were tending crops when they heard voices calling out to them in the bush. Nongaus, because she was a spiritual person and a healer, responded to these voices. She went together with her sister Nondeto to investigate and they found a deep hollow in the ground and from this hollow they heard the voices coming. And as the women knelt next to the hollow, the three amazing figures emerged from the grass. Tall men wearing long black robes made of 
animal skin with very big hoods on their heads appeared out of the hollow and one of their faces were painted white or so it seemed to the terrified Kosa women. And they were, these men were unusually tall. And they told the, the woman, Nongawuse, whom they distinguished by her attire as a traditional healer, that she must go to the Kosa people and tell them to start killing their cattle and start destroying their crops. Mr. Ike, I want to show you this book, a book which was published many years ago, a book written by me and which made me one of the most hated black men in South Africa by the white establishment. In this book, I write, amongst other things, about a man called Sir George Gray. And I, in this book, I questioned certain things about this man, because Sir George Gray was the creator of race discrimination and apartheid in South Africa. Apartheid was not really created by the Afrikaners. It was created by this man many, many years ago. Well, Sir George Gray was Illuminati, um, a black magician, and uh, fits the bill exactly with what happened in all these other countries you're talking about. Say, when I questioned the when I raised questions in this book about Sir George Gray, I was savagely attacked by nearly every professor in various universities of South Africa. The intellectual prostitutes, yeah? Yes. The liars in ivory towers, as I call them. I asked, I said that the 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 causes did not commit suicide in 1857 they were murdered they were manipulated by sir george gray into destroying themselves isn't it interesting cradle uh, i've noticed this myself that the story you just told about how those people were manipulated to kill their cattle and what have you um, is mirrored again and again in the story that has spawned religion after religion. I mean, whether it's Mohammed or whether it's Joseph Smith with the Mormons, again and again, the, the initiator has a vision or an interaction with some god figure or angel. And bingo, they get told to do certain things and the, the rest is history. Yes, sir. And what is most interesting is that these interesting angels have suddenly disappeared in recent times. You no longer hear of an angel coming to tell some prophet to establish a new religion. No. Where have they gone? They, they carefully choose certain times. Now, Sir George Gray said, so let me go back to him. He manipulated the Kosa people into killing themselves. And a poor woman, Nongaus, became the scapegoat because in every evil thing that has been done in Africa by the white colonialists, as well as by the Arab colonialists, there are always black scapegoats who are left holding the blame. And in this case, Nongausa was. According to, Af to South African official history books, we are told that Nongausa had had a dream 
that her people must kill their cattle, her people must kill, destroy their crops. And as a result of Nonaus's dream, thousands died. And another lie was added to compound this infamous lie. We were told that Nonaus had been a child when she had this dream. But that's a lie. Photographs of Nonaus taken after the terrible disaster show her as a mature woman who is wearing a beaded blanket and on that beaded blanket it is shown clearly in beaded patterns that she was a Sangoma who had undergone several initiations. She was not a girl but a spinster woman in her 25th year. And Nungaus had not had a dream whatsoever. She had seen apparitions. She had seen men who posed as gods, who were disguised as supernatural beings. And she had not been alone. And another thing, the Kosa people would never have li listened to the word of any mature child on a serious matter like this. Because to all African people, cattle and crops were not regarded as their property, but rather as the property of the ancestral spirits. Now, Nongaus became a scapegoat. For a long, long time, our people hated Nongaus for the dream she had supposedly had. And after I had brought questions about this story, after I had been torn apart by newspaper men, Nongaus's story was suddenly changed and totally omitted in South African history books. I can show you some of these books where this story doesn't occur at all. Taylor, is this uh, story that you're telling in, in this uh, one um, incident, can you um, repeat that again and again um, across Southern Africa as the um, Europeans took over? Was it a method they constantly used? Yes, sir. Yes, you see, I can tell you a lot of things that were done. Some of the bloody wars which were started in South Africa between white men and black men were actually engineered by supposedly ancestral spirits where a king suddenly saw an apparition. Mm -hmm. Now let me tell you, sir, one of these amazing stories, of which there are well over a hundred. And it is a true story that is known to every student of history in the land known as Lesotho. There was a great king, sir. The king's name was Muthomi. Muthomi was a priest king. He was a man who was both a healer and a king. Muthomi was getting old and he had received many wounds in, in battle, fighting to protect his people against invaders. One day, Muthomi was in his house when somebody knocked on the door frame of the house. And Muthomi asked the intruder to come in. 
and into their heart there came a frightening being, a being whose face was as white as the face of death, a being which wore a hood over its head, a being with unnaturally wide shoulders, a being who wore a long robe of sable antelope skin. This being squatted near the entrance of the, of the hut in which Mutlomi was. And the being told Mutlomi that he was to take one of his golden earrings, the earrings of kingship, and go on foot for a long distance to find a young man known as Diporco and to give him this earring. But what are you saying, great one? said Muthomi, utterly terrified by this unearthly being. You are saying that I, Muthomi, must go and find this boy and make him my successor? And the being said, yes, we, your forefathers, order you to do this. Mushomi was thunderstruck. He tried to argue because Mushomi had sons whom he was hoping would succeed him after death. Now he was now being told to go and seek out a strange young man and make him future king of the Basutu people. And as Muthomi tried to speak, the terrible tall being stood up in the hut and threw a handful of black powder on into the fireplace. There was a terrible flash, a burst of white smoke. And as Mutomi shielded his eyes, the being left the heart. On the following day, Mutomi told his people this in a council meeting. And the people advised Mutlomi to obey. You are the king, Mutlomi. You have been our king for a long time. You are blameless and you are as brave as a lion. But against the gods, what can you do? And thus it was that King Muthomi was given a tame ox by his people and he rode on the back of this ox accompanied by two of his best warriors and he went out to seek this strange boy whom he, he had been ordered to make future king of the Basutus. He found the boy with his companions high up on a mountain. The boy was, was a bandit. He lived by stealing cattle from rich men. He was a typical black Robin Hood. And Mutomi greeted this boy, Dipogo, and he pinned his golden earring to Dipogo's right ear and said, I am commanded by the spirits of my forefathers to appoint you, Dipogo, future king of the Basutu.
I am told that you are going to make this nation great. I am told that you are going to protect it. I, Mutomi, the armed one, have spoken. Mutomi left the port, and Mutomi sickened and died some time later. And the man named Deport, a young man, a cattle-stealing bandit, became known as King Mushweshwe, the first of the Basutu people. As the so-called God had spoken, it so did happen. Mushweshwe, who had now discarded the name of Dipogo, which means disappointment, and assumed the name Mushweshwe, which means the barber or the beard shaver. Mushweshwe himself started seeing visions and he started obeying the instructions of these visions that he should build a great nation out of the Basutu nation. He collected together all the fugitives who had fled from the wars in the Cape he collected together all the refugees who had fled from the wars by Shaka in Nata, and he molded them into the nation known as the Basutu nation, which today inhabits the land called Lesotho. But wait. There is more to the story of Mushweshwe. Mushweshwe was under attack by the, the, the Afrikaners. And one day he received another vision. A vision that told him that if his people were to be saved, he had to place himself and his people under the protection of Queen Victoria. And he did just that. When I was a child, when I was a young scholar, the land today known as Lesotho was known as the Basutu Land Protectorate. Here was a king actually destroying his sovereignty as a ruler. Mushweshwe enjoyed the loyalty of his people. Mushweshwe was greatly loved by the nation that he had formed. Mushweshwe had not really needed to make himself the subordinate of the British Empire, but he did on advice of visions that he had. My God, you can see how it was done. <laughs> but there is more, Mr. David Icke. Say, I think these men were secretly manipulated. I think these men had their fears and secret beliefs played against them. It is the easiest thing, say, to manipulate a man who, who rules a country and who suddenly feels himself insecure. For example, the British appear to have pursued a double-edged strategy 
in South Africa. They did it in Natal, they did it in Lesotho, and they did it in Swaziland and in Botswana. What did they do? They used to they used to manipulate the white African Africana settlers, the Boers, into fighting the native people. And then they used to send agents to the embattled black kings to tell these black kings that the best thing that they could do is to place their people and themselves under the protection of the British Empire. Problem, reaction, solution. Yes, sir. Now, let me ask you, sir, how did a black king know that the English were the most militarily powerful people at that time? The Africans only saw their immediate enemy, the Africaners. The, uh, the black people only saw the, the Boers traveling in their ox wagons. They only saw the, 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 the muskets of the Boers. But here we have a situation where a black king learns from someone about the powerful ships, sea-going ships, and the huge guns that the British have got. And this king is then advised to place himself and his people under the protection of the British. It was a strategy that the British pursued in different forms deep into Africa. They often won huge swaths of mineral-rich territory without even firing a shot. They had gun runners who smuggled bundles of muskets, tower muskets, and even Snyder rifles to black tribes. And wars between the Africaners and the blacks came into being in Lesotho. One of the reasons that forced Mushwesha to, to make Lesotho a protectorate under Great Britain was because he feared, uh, he feared the repeated attacks which the angry Boers were lynching against him because some of his people were attacking the Boer farmers and stealing their cattle. Can we talk about um, people like David Livingston and those that charted the interior of Africa, etc.? Because it seems, Credo, without question, we're looking at an unbroken stream here with one element of the takeover following another. So surely the, uh, those, um, quote, heroes of Britain that charted the interior of Africa must have been involved in the story. They were. They were. In fact, I can say to you now, sir, that the man in whose home Livingstone stayed, namely Reverend Moffat, was the one man who was grinding down King Kama's mind he was the one man who used to send books and newspapers to come. They were living in the land of the Botswana, and they lived alone, a missionary and his wife. M Reverend Moffat had a, a family of children at Kuruman, in, in, the, in the Northern Cape. And Reverend Moffat received Livingstone. Reverend Moffat 
because he was viewed by the Botswana as a man of God, could do what he liked in the land of the Botswana. He carved himself a huge stretch of land. He planted any vegetables or fruits there that he chose. Early in his arrival, he found that area teeming with buffaloes, which is why it is called Kuruma. It's really a corruption of the Botswana word Udumane, the gathering place of the buffaloes. Moffat used to welcome explorers and hunters, many of whom traveled alone through South Africa. And these hunters and adventurers, people like Cam, Reverend Campbell and others were going through South Africa exploring. Some of them wrote books about the local customs and the local tribes that they encountered. And I think these explorers were much more than what they seemed to so how is Christianity used? We've talked to, uh, uh, about the fact that the uh, beasts of the terrible blanket, these strange people that appeared before the Europeans, um, had introduced all the symbols and what have you that prepared people for Christianity in um, Africa. How was it used once the Christianity uh, people, uh, the Christian religion arrived? I will tell you, sir, from what I saw as a young child, the Christian religion, or rather the missionaries that brought it, behaved like dictators. They ill-treated our people, they humiliated them, and they stole huge tracts of land from our people using the name of Jesus Christ. I want to give you this historical fact, sir. If you go to Natal, near Derby, and you come to a place called Mary and Hill, near Derby, you will find one of the biggest and one of the oldest mission schools in South Africa. Mary and Hill sits on huge tracts of land. These tracts of land were stolen from the Zulu people by a missionary called Chimlet. And even to this day, the people of Marian Hill can tell you that that man was not just a missionary, he was also a crook and a pitiless exploiter of the black people. He was a monk, but he was much more than a monk. It was said that this chimlet worshipped not God, not the Virgin Mary, but Satan himself. Well, that fits like a glove uh, from the way the Illuminati work. And the uh, other thing that must have happened, um, fundamental in so many ways, is that the original knowledge, the knowledge that you carry and people like you carry, uh, must have been destroyed, pushed underground, and um, basically the true story of history lost. Yes, sir. Let me tell you what the missionaries did. The missionaries used to employ the tactic of preaching the so-called gospel to our people. And at the same time, they used to, they used to manipulate our people into partying with some of their holiest relics. Please, there is in London a place that I saw near the London docks in an obscure street. It is a heavily guarded warehouse which belongs to the British Museum 
of humankind. We were allowed to visit this place when I was in London in 1970, in, in, 19, in 1997. And there, in, the British, in that warehouse, I saw cupboard after cupboard after cupboard filled with priceless African artifacts in ivory, in bronze, in various indigenous woods and sometimes in iron and in gold. I saw royal bangles from dead kings, bangles made of brass and bronze, bangles which showed every sign that they had been removed by force from the arms of dead men and dead women. All these things, I was told, had been collected by the Theophilus Shepstone and the London Missionary Society and were sent to this museum where no African is allowed to view them. I was lucky because I was accompanied by a white woman whose father I suspect was a Freemason. Now, let me tell you, sir, what the missionaries did also. The missionaries established hospitals in their mission station. Reverend Moffat had a hospital in that mission station. And when an African was brought there, sick unto death, the missionary used to tell this African that as a condition to his entering the hospital, he first had to be baptized as a Christian. And also as another condition for entering the hospital and receiving missionary treatment, the sick African had to surrender all artifacts from his ancestors that he had in his possession. My God. One day, sir, my grandfather, Zeebo, had an accident. He had bought himself an ox wagon, but he did not know how to control it. And one day, the ox wagon plunged off a cliff, and my grandfather was badly injured. And when he was taken to a mission hospital in the west of Zululand, the first thing that the missionary said to my grandfather was this, that he knew the missionary, that my grandfather owned a heap of metal objects which he kept in, his, in one of his hearts. And that as a condition for receiving treatment for his broken bones, he had to surrender all that metal property to the missionary. Those things you have got in your home are full of evil spirits, said the missionary Reverend Lee. You must let me have them so that I can take them to a holy place in England where they would be destroyed. My grandfather stood up shakily and walked out of the mission hospital. He walked and somewhere along the, the road he collapsed and tribes people 
who knew him took him to their village and there when a passing Africana doctor rode by in his ox wagon the black people asked this doctor who was not a missionary to please take care of my grandfather. The doctor took my grandfather aboard his ox wagon and took him to his farm far away. And there, the Africana doctor, a herbalist really, as he was called, a genius Yeren, he treated my grandfather free of charge and he didn't place any conditions for his treatment and my grandfather out of gratitude returned to his village a healthy man and took three fat cows and led them with his sons to the faraway home of the African adopt. Again and again, our people were robbed of their heritage. Our people were robbed of scientific equipment. Our people were robbed of irreplaceable artifacts, some of them dating back hundreds of years into the past by the missionaries especially the London Missionary Society. And if you go into that museum, say, uh, near, the, near the, the docks in London, you will find what I saw, and it will make you weep. What's your own experience uh, in your life, Credo, of uh, the use of Christianity in Africa to divide, rule, and suppress the people? Now, let me tell you, sir. When missionaries came to South Africa, they deliberately created a huge wave of enmity between those blacks that they converted and those blacks who resisted Christian convention. They they created such a divide that they actually broke up huge families. And it even it got worse when Catholics, Anglicans, Methodists, and Presbyterians spread through South Africa. There was developed deliberately in Africans of different religious de denominations, the same enmity that exists now between the Catholics and the Protestants in England. Black Protestants were forbidden from talking to black Catholics. Black Wesleyans did not even ask the time of day from black Presbyterians. It was such a total chaos, and the only beneficiaries were the missionaries themselves. But let me tell you more what used to be done. Missionaries used to forbid any converted Christian black from having anything whatsoever to do with an unconverted black. Love relationships between so-called heathen blacks and Catholic blacks were forbidden by the missionaries. That was how my father and my mother parted traumatizing my life even before I was born. My father 
while he had been a confessing Catholic, and he fell in love with what was called a heathen Zulu woman. Now the condition for such a love was that the woman had to submit herself into the Christian faith. And my grandfather, a fierce old warrior, contemptuously refused to have my mother become a Christian convert. I used to kill white men at Isandwa, and I am not going to allow a daughter of mine to follow the religion of spear food. And say, if in a mission st station a, a, a church going black paid court to a heathen black, the church going black was brutally punished by the missionary. And he was punished in a way which to Africans was horrible. Inside the mission church, there were the pews the benches on which the, the congregation sat. But next to the door, just as you entered the door of the church, there were special benches for those Christian blacks who had broken the law. And so if it was found by the white missionary or the black missionary, that a certain person had had anything to do with a heathen, that person was punished in a very terrible way. He or she was made to sit next to the door of the church inside so that all who entered the church would look would look at this one and know that here is a lawbreaker who had broken the laws of Jesus Christ. Were you um, uh, pushed into the Christian religion to start with Credo before the penny dropped, did you like? Yes, sir, I was. You see, after my mother and my father had separated, my mother gave birth to me and for a long time I suffered as a child because I was born illegitimate. I was called a bastard. I had no rights as a human being. The law of the Zulus at that time was very, very strict regarding illegitimate children. My mother suffered. She was often beaten up by other girls in the village. And I suffered too. Other children were forbidden from playing with me. And I headed cattle in the bush alone. And there, many strange things happened to me which do not concern us here, however. And when I was seven years old, there came to my grandfather's village a brother of my father's. And he asked to take me away from there. And my grandfather said, nothing could please me more than that this little bastard should be removed from my home. He is a disgrace to my family. And so I was taken by my father's brother to the south of Natal, where I was baptized as a Catholic, and the ridiculous name Credo was placed upon my head, a name I hate very much, even to this day. 
I grew up say, as a Catholic. And we were all Catholics in our home, as most people in Natal are. And then one day, after we had left Natal, my father left the Catholic Church and adopted one of the worst branches of the Christian religion that you can find. My father started following the teachings of an American woman called Mary Baker Eddy. She, who was the leader of the Christian Science Church. Under the laws of the Christian Science Church, you are not allowed to take medicine under any circumstances, no matter how seriously ill you are. And for years we suffered, my half-sisters and my half-brothers and I. We sickened and we were not allowed to take any medicament. We had suffered before under the Catholic Church, having to confess sins every weekend to a priest we could barely see. Sometimes it was so ridiculous that we, we often created sins against ourselves we had not committed in order to please the Catholic Father. And now we were suffering under the teachings of Mary Baker Eddy, teachings which I I now see in my adult life as having been the very essence of the purest rubbish. Then, after a great sickness in 1937, I was taken, during my, that great sickness, I was taken back to Zululand by my father's brother, Anton. And there, I was healed by a man I had been conditioned to be looked upon as a stupid heathen, namely my grandfather, my, my father's, my, the father of my mother. After that, sir, I began to see how great the knowledge that the black people possessed was. I began to see that the missionaries were actually deceiving us, that they were teaching us lies at school about our people. And then one day I got into serious trouble. I was now a budding artist, painting pictures for the mission school. And I made the mistake of portraying the Virgin Mary as a Zulu woman based upon my mother's face. And I portrayed Jesus Christ as a Zulu boy. And for that, I was caned and expelled from school. The reason I was not caned say, by, by the white missionary only. I was caned also by the black teachers who accused me of having insulted Jesus Christ by painting him as a black. So you can see, sir, the stark mental confusion into which our people had been plunged. Men caning a boy because he had painted Christ as a black man and saying that by blackening Christ's face, this boy had, had blasphemed. Just makes you see, Credo, how easy it is for the few to control the world when most of the world gives its mind away. Yes, sir, but one must understand, Mr. David Ike, that we human beings 
are weak creatures. We fall a victim to ill health. We fall a victim to sometimes nameless fear. And that is where the forces of darkness pounce upon us when we are afraid, sick, or insecure. Many black people who were converted easily to Christianity were people who had been traumatized by war. You see, during the great Zulu wars in Natal, thousands of black men and women used to run away from Zululand to Deben, where huge refugee camps, bigger than anything we have ever seen in Africa, soon blossomed. These refugee camps were fertile ground for Christian missionary operations. These refugee camps were places where many a self-seeking missionary was sure of walking away with several hundred converts. Credo, um, all these methods we've been talking about here um, uh, can be uh, connected to this one stream unbroken under different names that came out of London. The next major stream I'd like to look at was that represented by Cecil Rhodes and the British South Africa Company, which, um, from what I've seen, transformed perhaps more than anything the uh, structure, the economy, and the life of South Africa. W what about him and that time? <laughs> many, many stories are told about Cecil Rhodes. Many, many, many stories. And one day I shall amuse you with one. Cecil Rhodes was a strange man. Like all great men, he was a weird mixture of great viciousness and mercifulness. Cecil Rhodes was a seeker after knowledge. And he used to do many things for those blacks who gave him the knowledge he sought. First, Cecil Rhodes was interested in legends that he had heard about Africa and the Africans. He wanted to know where our people used to mine minerals. And his men used to go from village to tribal village carrying cheap blankets, traveling shawls, and stats and heads to bribe tribes people into showing them where mines were, ancient African mines were. In fact, I can tell you, sir, that many of the mineral deposits that are in South Africa, from the diamonds of Kimberley in the Cape, to the coal fields of Natal, to the gold mines of, of the Witwatersrand and of the land now known as Zimbabwe, all of these mineral deposits were pointed out to Rhodes and his men by Africans. Africans willing to do anything to impress this strange white man. Cecil Rhodes smiled very often, especially before he ordered the slaughter of an entire tribe. Cecil Rhodes got to know how deeply our people respected a powerful man who reconciled two clashing factions. 
And one amazing thing, when confronted by black people who were asking him pointed questions, Cecil Rhodes used to deny that he was the leader of the white people, for example, in Rhodesia. He acted like a third party, a man who was dedicated to reconciling black and white and stopping conflict between them. And until he died, say, Cecil Rhodes was known by the, the Mandebele people as Mlamlangunzi the brave one who parts two clashing bulls. At one time, Cecil Rhodes went to a very holy place and a group of hills called Ndabazenduna and there, under a tree whose remains can still be seen. Cecil Rhodes sat with a group of Matebele elders and actually persuaded them to stop warlike actions against the British Empire. How did he manipulate uh, the black tribes of Africa so that he got all these mineral rights which have now become consolidated gold fields and De Beers and Anglo-American. Cecil Rhodes used to walk about completely unafraid amongst the Matebele people and he used to tell them to attack the Mashona people whom he called dogs. And in this way Cecil Rhodes Caused, the, caused wars between blacks, which he then stepped in as an intercessor. Cecil Rhodes built up a formidable hatred between the Matebeles and the Mashonas. He played the Matebeles off against the Mashonas and the same the other way around. What is strange about Cecil Rhodes was that 